And we are live with today's pre-show of our 220-1101 Core 1A Plus study group. I am still getting the studio together, getting things put away, getting things uh, confirmed, checking. It's like we've got cameras are up, presentation looks good. We've got our Cylons going down here, so we know that there is recording going on. I can pause me here because uh, that bothers me a little bit. Uh, let's see. Audio is good. We can turn that off. That is on. Very nice. Hello, chat room. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking in. We got about uh, nine minutes, nine minutes and a few seconds before we get started on today's study group. Uh, it's all in this first hour questions from the A-plus exam objectives. All you have to do is sit back and enjoy that. And then... We've got uh, the, the, the after show. After that is you ask me questions. So it's a lot of, a lot of questions and answers today, I guess. Uh, or we could just have a chat. We don't have to do Q&A if you don't want to. But that's certainly an option. Hey, chat room. Thanks for being here. I see folks are checking in. We, got, uh, we have a lot to go through. It's been, what, uh, uh, a month or two, it seems. No, it's only been two weeks. It just seems like two months since I've done the live stream. So that's great. Fantastic. Uh, I think the, the goal here is just make sure uh, we get everything ready to go here. I think we are in good shape. We've got questions. Yep, everything is all set up. I think we are in great shape. Uh, Mohammed in the chat room is asking, what laptop do I use? And then there's he also mentions an iMac, which is not a laptop, but the the device in front of me is uh, not an iMac. I used to have iMac, iMac Pros. It's what I used in here quite a bit. Uh, no longer use an iMac. I have a uh, Mac Mac Studio, I guess is the name. Can't see it's sort of behind. You can kind of see the corner of it right there behind the uh, iPad. Um, because it it really should be down here, but I didn't put it down there. Well, it's a whole story. Why haven't I put it down there yet? Well, that's another story, but we won't talk about that story. We have a lot to sort of unpack there, but it is there and it is working and it's connected to both of these monitors that are to my right. So that's the primary monitor. That's the secondary. And uh, I have separate monitors over here for the video production. So those are normally not on. Those two big monitors, they are usually just off. I'm usually just focusing on these two. I'd really like to set up the studio to have three monitors always on, which is entirely possible. I don't know why I haven't set it up that way to begin with, because that would be fantastic. The things I would be able to do on three screens would be amazing, uh, but it requires a bit of changes here. And as many of you know, you don't, I don't really like to change much with the studio until I have plenty of time to test it. And when we do these live streams, they're usually a couple days apart from each other or a week apart from each other. So I've really got a plan that whole thing out. But I think three monitors is uh, absolutely doable. It's just that I would have to undo that for the live stream. See how this now becomes more complicated? <laughs> it's uh, all of those things. So we'll figure it out. There's quite a bit to go through. Let's, oh, I don't think I have the questions up and running yet. So let's get the QA up and running. Here we go. Let's launch a quiz for core one. The May, I don't need your name. Uh, I don't need question. Uh, oh, this teacher paste. I don't need your name. Boom. Let's launch it. Is that the right one? Five, nine? It is. There we go. Now we have a question you can answer. And we'll show you to answer that question as we get started here on the live stream. But it's going to be uh, it's going to be professormesser.com slash QA, as it always is. So we always have a way to do that. I've not tried curved screens. I don't really see the value in those for my setup. Um, in fact, it seems a little more clunky than anything. Those are great for, you know, if you have a big, broad, wide area. But I, I really need that 16 by 9 because all the videos are produced 16 by 9. When you get a monitor that is not 16 by 9, it complicates the recording process. So that's why I don't have anything other than something that is close to 16 by 9. That aspect ratio becomes pretty important. So that's why this is not really a gaming setup. If I had a gaming setup, yeah, I'd get one of those monster monitors that are big and wide, and curve around you, and are just amazing. And no, not uh, not for this particular setup, unfortunately. 
That's the way it goes. Okay, we've got a lot to go through today. I've got all brand new questions. We've got, I, I don't remember what they are. I wrote them, I don't know, weeks ago, so I don't remember. Uh, so that's that's sort of how that works. There's uh, there's not much more. Let's have a look at, uh, make sure folks are getting in. Okay, uh, some, some more uh, analytics would be good. Yeah, folks are there. Hey, everybody. Folks checked in. Let's get this ready here. I don't know what the questions will be about. Let's Play says, what about Raid? What about a question about Raid? I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> I mean, I know. I could look it up, but I don't remember. It's, you're asking a lot for me right now to remember what I did two weeks ago. I don't remember what I did this morning. So that's sort of how it usually works for me. What section makes up the largest percentage of the A-plus exam usually? No usual about it. It's all listed in the CompTIA exam objectives. They tell you exactly what section takes up the largest percentage of the exam. I would recommend you get that exam objectives. I'll talk about those in just a bit. What, what is the best resource for practice exams that's closely related to the actual exam for A-plus? Well, thank you for asking. You should go to professormesser.com and get my practice exams, which I specifically wrote to emulate or have the same feel as the actual exam at least on the questions, the style of questions, the information they ask, the way they have the answers. It's, I have a book for that. So you can do that. Oh, look at Ace. Thank you, Ace, for so much. Let's see if I can get this on the screen. There we go. Thanks so much, Professor Messer, helping me pass my core one. Ace of Hearts, core one is now in the can, as they say. Now it's time to get the core two done. So this is fantastic. You're halfway done. Congratulations on your core one. It's, it is, uh, now you know exactly what to expect for core two, right? It's the same thing except different topics. So that's kind of nice. We get that together. Um, so best of luck with core two. And thanks so much for the super chat uh, support as well. It's certainly appreciated. We've got a few more minutes. We've got uh, two and a half minutes before we get started. And then who knows what's going to happen? I, I won't. I don't know. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Uh, let's do a quick um, audio check. These are supposed to be set, right? Yep, that looks fine. Those look good. Back to the switcher. Back to, back to life. Back to reality. We are in good shape there. Here, here. Yep. Last final check there. So, well, we'll have to see. Are the exams based on the exam objectives from CompTIA? Of course. I would say my set of practice exams is the most accurate set of exams I've seen towards the version of the exam objectives. So there you go. My thoughts on chat GPT. It is as wrong as much as it is right. It, it is. I've, I've done some testing with it and it's awful. It, it leads you down a completely wrong path so many times that I can't, it, it's just not there yet. So at least not for what we do. It's not there yet. It comes up with these crazy schemes and ideas and thoughts and allegories, and it's weird. It's odd. <laughs> it's unusual. Uh, it can it, it cannot help you pass your exams. It can help you do a very mediocre job on your exams. There you go. It is. It's bad. It's not good. It, it, it's it's a it, it is an encouraging step towards something that's a little more intelligent than the basic Google search, but not much more. It's not that great. It's it's nowhere near being good. But they'll they'll figure it out. They'll get something behind it and do. The nice part of I don't have AI at professormaster.com. I just have I. And ultimately I at this point is so much better than AI. So I think that's that's the real benefit for us. I think I is the uh is what you need when you're really trying to, I don't know, get a job, pass a certification exam. You really need somebody who's done this before to give it the once over and say, yes, that's an accurate representation of reality. And unfortunately, AI can't do that. Only I can. Not I. Not I, me, but I, intelligence. Although I'll say I, me. Sure, why not? That's <laughs> completely, completely wrong, but we'll do that. Let's put that right there. Let's put this. Oh, it's so bright. Let's put this down a little bit. Very nice. I think we are almost ready. This says 12 o'clock. I say that that's, uh, that's what we do. 12 o'clock. And now, of course, I've got brightness turned all the way up. 
Let's change this to Keynote. Let's click the button for green, which is what we want. Very nice. That looks good. I think we're ready for a live stream, everybody. Let's absolutely do this. Um, let's get started here in just a moment. See, now I have to remember, how does, how does this work again? I'm not quite sure how all, how any of these things <laughs> operate. Oh, there we go. And there we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May 2023 Professor Messer a plus study group. This is our core one A plus study group. Uh, we're look at me flip around to the cameras there. Coming to you live from our studios, we do one of these live streams every month where we take questions and ideas directly from the CompT exam objectives. We present them to you online. You're able to answer the questions online as we are here live. We have a good time in this first hour doing that. And if you stick around for the second hour, which we call our after show. I'll take questions from the chat room, and you can ask me anything you'd like. I don't know that I'll answer anything you'd like, but I'll certainly take questions for anything that you would like. I'm more than happy to step through that. There were some questions in the chat room earlier that asked, well, how do you answer these questions? I'm glad you asked. What you have to do is pop open a new browser window and go to professormesser.com slash QA. That is where you need to go to have a question waiting for you. Now, there's also an app for this. The app is the Socrative Student app. That's the one you should look for in your favorite app store. And if you do that, it will ask you for a room name. The room name is professormesser.com. Uh, Professor Messer, just one word. There's no .com. There's no QA. It's just Professor Messer. So go to Professor, go to Socrative Student app. It will ask you for a room name. It's right there on the screen. Professor Messer, one word, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E Make sure you spell it right. That will be so important when you step through this. Now, if you do that, you either pop open a new browser window or you load up the app. There will be a question waiting for you. That question asks, a network scanner uses SMB to store the digital scans. Which of the following would be the most likely destination for these files? Would it be cloud storage, FTP server, digital certificate, window share, or web server? So this is what you want to focus on is those five questions. And our standing rule in the chat room is please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We want to be able to step through all of these and really understand the question, understand the answers. And we're going to take no input from anyone else. We're just going to lock in our answer by going to the link that's on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA. You can also use the app for this. We will come back to this question in just a moment. Well, thank you for being here. We do one of these study groups for each one of the courses I provide on my website. So A plus core one, A plus core two, network plus, security plus. There's a live stream every month for each one of those. You can find that on our website. We have a calendar there you can sort through. Of course, when we're not here doing a live stream, we're producing more videos. You should subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can see those at professormesser.com slash YouTube. We also have daily pop quiz questions for A plus. You can find those on Twitter. Twitter at professormesser.com slash Twitter. I also publish a pretty picture version of our daily pop quiz on Instagram. Go to professormesser.com slash Instagram to see that as well. And the great place to sign up, register, subscribe, join, or whatever that social media thing would like you to do. It really does help quite a bit. I like uh, I like Let's Play in the chat room. It says, let's reach a million subscribers on YouTube. I think that would be phenomenal. We're still a little bit away from that, but but really not much farther away from that. We'll have to see how things go here over the coming months. As you are watching this, there may be a number of you that are focusing on earning a continuing education unit credit. This is obviously for the folks that have already earned one of these certifications. If you're still working towards your very first cert, that won't apply to you. But for those of you that do collect CEUs, you want to listen in sometime during this first hour, I will give you instructions and information on how you can receive a digitally signed email from me that certifies that you are here for a one hour of a CEU webinar category CEU. Now, if we talk about the exam, you'll notice that the A-plus is a two-exam certification. You have to pass two separate exams to earn your A-plus. Those two exams are the 220 
and to 2011-02. Those are the two versions of the exams that are currently live and active. These were released in April the 20th of 2022, so they really haven't been around very long. And of course, our estimated exam retirement for this will be somewhere around October of 2025. Uh, that means you have plenty of time as we sit here in 2023 to get through all of your A-plus studies. There's not going to be any problem for you at all. These exams are both 90 minutes long. You will get a maximum of 90 questions per exam. And the exam, uh, the, the scoring is a little bit unusual. It is on a scale from 100 to 900. And you need to score 675 on the 1101 and a 700 on the 1102. So it's a little bit different between them, but pretty close, pretty close to each other and what you want to focus on. The goal, of course, is just do as best you can on the exam. You really don't have a lot of control over the scoring process. So you only know the final score when you fit, hit the, the complete button, you hit the grade me button, and then you'll know. You'll finally be able to do that. Once you're certified, of course, your certification is good for three years. And of course, I, I imagine most of you will continue to renew this certification so you don't have to take these two exams anymore. So that makes it makes it very use, useful if you're going through this. I mentioned in the pre-show that one of the most important documents you can have for this exam is a free document that CompTIA will give you. All you have to do is go to their website. You can follow the link. That is on my screen, professormesser.com slash objectives. There's a link that will take you over to the CompTIA website where you can download those objectives or simply search for the objectives in your favorite search engine by typing in CompTIA exam objectives, and it's right there and ready for you. So folks in the chat room were even asking about, well, how do you renew these certifications? If you look at the YouTube uh, video description of this video, there is a link to my video on how to renew your certification in just a few hours. That steps you through every iteration of renewal and what the good parts and bad parts are about each one of those. So there are these two exams are the 1101 and 1102. What we're going to focus on today is the 1101, which means the questions for today will be concerning mobile devices, networking, hardware, virtualization and cloud computing, and hardware and network troubleshooting. So you've got a little bit of a, a mix there to choose from. We'll try to go through at least these broader topics one at a time as we step through each one of these. There, of course, a video replay of this is available immediately afterwards on YouTube. I also post an audio replay in podcast form. If you'd like to add this to your podcast listening program, simply go to professormesser.com slash podcast and follow the links there, either for the XML links. You may also find this in your favorite podcast listening uh, library. They may have it listed there for you. Or if you're on a streaming service you like to use, like Spotify, you can simply search for Professor Messer on Spotify and listen to all of our study groups from there as well. Uh, if you wait about a day, you'll also notice in the YouTube video description for this video that suddenly timestamps will magically appear with descriptions of what happened during those timestamps. Well, it's not magic. It's my marketing manager, Lori, who's watching this. Hi, Lori. She's going through this entire process of reading, watching the whole thing, probably at 2x speed, and puts she puts down all of the timestamps for us so we can find exactly what we are looking for. And that's a that's a fantastic resource. She's been doing this literally for years now. You can go back to any of our previous live streams and find exactly what you're searching for. I'll also let you know that when we are not here live, you can find us on Discord. That's our chat for our website. Go to professormesser.com slash Discord to join us. There is a fantastic community there. There are studies going on there Every night, it seems, there are multiple live studies going on where people will get into an audio or video chat room. They'll talk about exam topics. They'll watch the videos together. They'll answer questions. It is a great learning experience. We try to foster that on our Discord. We'd love for you to join. Go to professormesser.com slash Discord. Also let you know that eventually you will want to take your exam. Uh, it's true. You'll need to take the exam to earn the certification. Well, you can, of course, go to the CompTIA website and pay full price to take your exam. But why would you do that? If you're in the U.S. or Canada or one of the U.S. territories, you can get a discounted voucher at the Professor Messer website. Simply visit professormesser.com slash vouchers, and you'll notice that they're, all of the vouchers are already discounted. There's no discount code you'll need. There's no special access that you need to plug in. Uh, it, they're just already discounted. You can't beat that. Not only are they discounted, 
but I want to give you a little bit of something extra when you buy a voucher from my website. You get a copy of my Exam Hacks ebook. This ebook is not for sale. It's only available for people that already have my uh, success bundles or they purchased a voucher on my website. This is a list of life hacks, if you will, that I've accumulated over the years as I've taken 20, 25, 30 certification exams during my career. And there are little tips and tricks that may help you for the CompTIA exams. I put them into this exam hacks book. So hopefully that can help you as you're going through the process of studying for your exam. Sometimes getting a couple extra points during the exam is a useful thing. And perhaps this exam hacks ebook can help you with that. Let's go back to that question we asked earlier. The question asked, a network scanner uses SMB to store the digital scans. Which of the following would be the most likely destination for those files? Is it cloud storage, FTP server, digital certificate, Windows share, or web server? Well, we'll have to see what you chose. 147 of you have locked in your answer already. Let's see what you chose for this one. This is a question from last month's study group. And I like to see how many people remember some of these topics. Plus, it helps to make sure that everybody's able to get in and answer these questions. And you can see here on the screen, 49% of you say Windows Share is the most likely destination for these files. But 21% say NFTP server would be a good location. 15% say it is cloud storage. 11% say web server. And 3% say digital certificate. Well, this obviously was a question that focused around that key abbreviation at the top. A network scanner uses SMB. That SMB is server message block. That is a mechanism for transferring files, print jobs, and performing file manipulations primarily in the Windows operating system. So if you are scanning something on a network scanner, there's often a number of options where you can send this information somewhere. Maybe you just wanted to email it to yourself. And you can do that. Please send this scan to this email inbox. But it would be much more convenient if the scanner would simply put the scanned file into a share that's available in Windows. And you can do that using the Microsoft shares and focus on using SMB, server message block, because that is the mechanism that Windows uses to transfer data from one Windows device to another. Now, of course, there's other options on these devices. You can might be able to use FTP. You might be able to put things into a Google Drive or into Dropbox or some other cloud-based service. But this question really asked about SMB. So when you see that, you know there's going to be a number of technologies that may come into play. If you see SMB, you should automatically be thinking, this is probably something Windows related because Windows is the primary, certainly the, the vast majority of SMB traffic on our networks today is Microsoft Windows traffic. So make sure you understand what SMB is and how it's different than things like cloud storage, which commonly uses HTTPS or some other encrypted method to send the data, FTP server, which is a perfectly reasonable way to transfer files, but that's using the FTP protocol and not the SMB protocol. We also have digital certificates. That's not where you store data. So we wouldn't be putting our scan into a digital certificate. And then 11% said a web server. SMB is not commonly used to store files on web servers either. The answer, the one that 51% of you have chosen, is Windows Share Answer D. And that would be the right answer. So hopefully that's giving you some insight into one of the questions we did last month that's really focused on SMB. Make sure you're familiar with that protocol. And if you have questions about any of the protocols, make sure you're familiar with all of them. This question came from our section on multifunction devices, uh, section 3.6 of the 2.20.11.01. The video name is called multifunction devices. Let's keep going with the topics that I have for you today. That was a question from last month. All of the questions going forward, brand new, that have been written specifically for this live stream. So the next question I have for you, though, is not a multiple choice question. It's a question that is asking something beyond the scope of multiple choice. It might be a fill in the blank. It might be a matching question. It could be a question where you have to put things in a particular order. It might be a drag and drop question. Those types of questions CompTIA refers to as a performance-based question. Those performance-based questions are effectively anything but multiple choice. 
But what's important to remember is they are still re really associated with topics that come directly from the CompTIA exam objectives. So this isn't information you don't know about. This isn't something new that wasn't listed in the exam objectives. It's exactly the same information you've already been studying. They're simply asking you the question in a different way. So the question I have for you today is a matching question, and it's done very much in the style of matching questions on an actual CompTIA exam, although the question I have for you today is one that is brand new. You won't see this on a CompTIA exam because I wrote it just for you today. The question asks, match these network protocols to their function. Not all functions will be used. So I have four protocols that I've listed on the screen. The protocols are Telnet, SMTP, RDP, and FTP. So I've already, and if you've been listening, there may be even a hint here from previous questions that might help you. You've also got seven different functions. So you can already see that we're going to have some functions left over. Because this is a one-to-one -one match, you're going to have three of these left over at the end. The first one is transfer messages from an email server to a tablet. The second is use the command line of a remote device. The third is automatically assign IP addresses to every device. The fourth is control the desktop of a remote Windows laptop. E is send emails from a mobile phone. F is convert a host name to an IP address. And G is transfer a file between Windows and Linux. So you've got a number of different options there. Let's see if you know what these happen to be. As always, if you think you know the answer, please do not answer in the chat room. You want to answer by visiting the link that's on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA. That will allow you to lock in the answer. We'll see how well you do with that one. For those of you listening in on the podcast sign again, this is, this is pretty useful. Uh, you can, of course, see all four of these network protocols. They are Telnet, SMTP, RDP, and FTP. And of the seven different functions that I've listed here are transfer messages from an email server to a tablet, use the command line of a remote device, automatically assign IP addresses to every device, control the desktop of a remote Windows desktop, remote Windows laptop, send emails from a mobile phone, convert a host name to an IP address, and transfer a file between Windows and Linux. So if you already think these are in the right order, you can simply put into the link at professormesser.com slash QA. You can go to uh, and type in 1A2B3C4D. Done. That's all you have to type in. The important thing for you is to remember what you typed in so that you can, of course, be able to see that when we come through all of these. See if you happen to know what these are. These are seven different functions. And if you'd like some extra credit at the end of it, there will be three of these explanations of these functions left over. What protocols could be used with that function? So we'll sort of reverse it as we go through this. And we'll see if we can figure that out at the end with those three that happen to be left over. That might help you also with the process of determining which ones do fit the four different protocols that I've listed on this screen. So lock in your answer. Follow the link that's on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA. Lock in your answer number if you've already put the answers in. I want to let a couple more go through here. I know this one is a, this, and, and this is common for performance-based questions. It's almost like having four questions combined into one. So there's a, there's a really good example of trying to fit a lot of information into a single question. Um, and a lot of people uh, want to ask, well, can I get, maybe some partial credit if I get some right and some wrong. CompTIA has said officially on their website, maybe. We won't tell you when you get partial credit. We may not give you partial credit, or we might give you partial credit. So at least they've said it's possible. At least they didn't say, no, no, no partial credit ever. They've said sometimes there could be partial credit. But of course, sometimes there may not be partial credit. We just don't know. So do the best you can. There's no way to know either during the exam, and really there's no way to know after the exam either. It's really a mystery to all of us. So the best you can do is just keep doing what you're doing. Go through the process of doing your exam, passing the, the exam the best you can, uh, answer the questions as best you can, and then at the end, if everything works out, the scoring will, will all work for you. 
So hopefully that can work you through the process as well. Let's step through each one of these protocols and see what I put in the list for each one of these. We're going to start very much at the top of this with the Telnet protocol. Telnet is a protocol commonly used to control the command line that's on a remote device. Now, probably not the most secure method because it doesn't encrypt any data. But Telnet certainly works if you're trying to, as we say in option B, use the command line of a remote device. Normally, you probably wouldn't use Telnet for this. You'd probably use SSH because SSH, or Secure Shell, is an encrypted form of communication for controlling the command line of a remote device. We also have our second on the list, SMTP, all these acronyms. That is the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And if you know the, the acronym, you might be able to decipher when you would use this. It doesn't always work that way, however. So I would caution you not to spend a lot of time on SMTP means Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. SMB means Server Message Block. Because Server Message Block is a really good example of this. SMB means Server Message Block. You know, what does that mean? What is that? How do you use that? It doesn't tell me anything about what it does. So don't fall into that trap. You should study three things. The acronym, the description of the acronym, really the, the definition, server message block. But then you also need to study what does that do for us? How would you use that? In what, what circumstance would you see that particular protocol? In this case, SMTP is the simple mail transfer protocol, which means that we could e send emails from a mobile phone using that protocol. Now, that's not always the only protocol that we would use to send mail from a mobile phone. But given the options that we had on our list, those seven different functions, that really is the only one that makes any sense is answer E, send emails from a mobile phone. Third on our list is RDP. RDP is an abbreviation for Remote Desktop Protocol. So there's an acronym that knowing the terms in the acronym may help you answer a question, Remote Desktop Protocol. I'm probably remotely controlling the desktop of a third-party device. So if you want to control the desktop of a remote Windows laptop, you're probably going to use RDP. Again, it's not the only way to control the desktop of a remote Windows laptop. But in our list of four protocols and the list of seven different functions, that's the only one that matches up. So remote desktop protocol is a great option. You're probably already using that if you're using Windows. The last protocol is FTP. We've already talked about FTP today. FTP stands for the File Transfer Protocol. It's a very generic way to transfer data. We mentioned in the previous question that SMB was very commonly used in Windows to transfer data. But what if you weren't transferring to a Windows device? What protocol would work to be able to do that? And FTP works great if you want to transfer a file between Windows and Linux, for example, or Windows and Mac OS, or Mac OS and Linux, or Linux and anything else. Uh, it's a very generic type of protocol to use. It works across many different types of operating systems and platforms. It's not specific or exclusive to a particular operating system. That makes it perfect for transferring data between Windows and Linux. The, uh, the, the other three that were not chosen on our list were A, transfer messages from an email server to a tablet, C, automatically assign IP addresses to every device, and F, convert a host name to an IP address. And I said, for extra credit, maybe you could determine the reverse of this. What protocol would you use for these three different scenarios? So let's take the first one, transfer messages from an email server to a tablet. And there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, if you've got an email server, you could use POP3. You could use IMAP4. I'll, I'll accept both of those. Those are very common ways to do it. But you can also do this by using Microsoft Exchange, by using Gmail. There's other options there to be able to do that. But uh, if you were to put any of those down, I would accept it as correct. I just put this in this list so we can see a good example of what one might be. And POP3 and IMAP are probably the most popular. POP3 is, is indeed the post office protocol. IMAP, the internet message, 
uh, internet message protocol, especially IMAP, is probably used well above and beyond what POP3 is used for. Almost everybody's converted over to IMAP because IMAP allows you to manage folders, move uh, messages around, store everything on a, a remote server, and then you can connect to that server from all of your devices and everything is synchronized up. One of the nice things about Outlook is it does a similar thing. So we could have put Outlook into that that list too instead of POP3 or IMAP, but that's that's okay. That's a, a great way to transfer messages from an email server to a tablet. The next on our list that we did not use is automatically assign IP addresses to every device. And I bet a lot of you already know the answer to this one. It's almost exclusively DHCP, the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. DHCP is extremely useful for and is practically used universally on every network I have ever been on. And I've been on thousands of different company networks, just uh, visiting, uh, having meetings, uh, giving presentations, visiting trade shows. They're all using DHCP, and you're probably using DHCP in your house as well. When's the last time you ever manually configured an IP address? I'll bet it's been a long time. So uh, this makes it so easy for IP address because you don't have to manually configure anything. You just turn on DHCP. All of your devices will find a DHCP address that is unique to them, and they'll automatically be able to connect to the internet, and the rest of your family won't bother you. That's that's really the important part of DHCP. I think that speaks pretty well also in a corporate environment too. The last one on our list is answer F, convert a host name to an IP address. And one great way to do that conversion, it's a conversion that happens tens, hundreds, maybe thousands of times a day on your system, is the, is the DNS. The name services is an important part of any network. And when you're communicating to the internet, these name services become critical because all you know is www.professormesser.com. Quick, what's my IP address? You don't know. I don't know. I don't keep track of that. Uh, instead, you simply type in www.professormesser.com, and your browser magically finds the IP address somehow. But when you look into it, it's really not magic at all. It's simply the DNS protocol being able to locate that particular IP address, bring it down to your system, and now you can communicate directly to my web server using that IP address. That's the important part. So if you uh, went through this list, Telnet would be to use the command line of a remote device. SMTP is to send emails from a remote device. RDP is able to control the desktop of a remote Windows laptop. FTP is transfer a file between Windows and Linux. And then for transferring messages from an email server to a tablet, we could use POP3, IMAP, or a number of different protocols. Automatically assigning IP addresses to every device is DHCP, and converting a host name to an IP address is DNS. Those are what turned out to be seven different protocols and seven different functions. Hopefully, you were able to match those up if you don't recognize any of those protocols or you don't immediately remember what that protocol does. I would highly recommend you go back to that list that is in your exam objectives. They list out every protocol you need to know, all the port numbers associated with those protocols, and make sure that you can give a use case for each one of those protocols that is unique to that particular protocol. So pretty important if you're somebody who's really focusing on this that's what I would also recommend you do. That was your performance-based question of the month. Hopefully, you got that one locked down pretty well. If not, you've now got some things that you know you can go back and study before sitting down for the actual exam because certainly one of these mini protocols listed on the exam objectives will show up on the exam somewhere. Let's now focus back to a multiple choice based question. So here's the next question on our list. This question asks, a stylus is no longer working on a tablet computer. Which of the following would be the most likely failed component? Would that be digitizer, M.2 drive, system RAM, USB interface, or inverter? 
We've got five different options to choose from. If you think you know the answer, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. You want to follow the link that's on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. The question again is a stylus is no longer working on a tablet computer. Which of the following would be the most likely failed component? Would that be a digitizer, an M.2 drive, system RAM, USB interface, or inverter? One of those has got to be the right answer. If you think you know the right answer, lock it in right now by visiting professormesser.com slash QA. That's the link that's on your screen. And see if you happen to know what this is. Mike in the chat room is asking, how do I make my topology diagrams? Well, if I was on Windows, I would probably be using something else for this. But I'm in Mac OS. So I'm commonly using, uh, what is the name of the Mac OS utility that I bring up? It's OmniGraffle is the one that I primarily use. There's also a number of great online topology creation tools that are cloud-based. Those are great as well. Uh, the real key with topology diagrams is not necessarily how you make them, but more importantly, the data you're putting down into that system. If you made a topology diagram in Windows, you're probably using Visio. If you're making a Mac OS, you could be using OmniGraffle or one of the others, or there's plenty of cloud-based uh, and I have an, a section on this, and I think it's on my Network Plus, where I talk about network documentation, and I list out a number of cloud-based services that are out there that look pretty good. I don't use those cloud-based services, but uh, the ones that I've seen people using are quite effective and flexible and provide information, especially if you're sharing this information with others, but perhaps not if this information is... Uh, something that is private or proprietary or is a would be a security issue if it were to get out. And that's, that's really my biggest problem with network diagrams. When I used to work as a cybersecurity systems engineer, people would hand me, I'd walk in the door, they'd hand me their network diagram, and I'd say, wait a second, I don't know if I want to see this. Because it has IP addresses internal to the network. It has a list of all the servers. If anything happens, I walk out the door from that meeting, and that night, Somebody breaks into the network and takes data uh, or some other type of breach occurs. I happen to know the information they gave me that could have affected or provided additional access to their system. I don't I don't want the keys to the kingdom. I would rather you give me a broad overview on a whiteboard and we'll talk about how we would implement that. Later on, if this becomes something we might want to implement or we want to go down the road of professional services, we can sign a non-disclosure agreement and there could be some legality around that. But be very careful about giving out your private network information to others. It could be used against you. Let's see how you did with this question. It asks, a stylus is no longer working on a tablet computer. Which of the following would be the most likely failed component? Is it a digitizer, an M.2 drive, system RAM, a USB interface, or an inverter? And let's see how you answered the question. And I can see 90% of you, 9-0. This big bar across the screen says, of course, it's digitizer. That's what we would have chosen. We have 4% that said inverter, 3% that's USB interface, 2% that said M.2 drive, and nobody said system RAM, which means by far, everybody thinks it's digitizer. Now, what's interesting about this and this might surprise you. Well, it won't surprise you at all because the answer is digitizer. That is the right answer. There is built into the screen that you're using in, in many cases a way to convert the touch or stylus input that is obviously analog because it's coming from your hand or your finger. It's converting that analog touch into a digital representation. It's effectively digitizing what you are pushing on the screen. And that is literally the, the definition of a digitizer. Now, some of your later uh, devices uh, have a combination of using this digitizer in conjunction with Bluetooth. So you'll notice I didn't put Bluetooth as one of the options here because that might have thrown you off. If Bluetooth isn't working, that could also affect your ability to use a stylus on a tablet computer, but I've got I've got a stylus on my tablet computer that I use. It requires Bluetooth and it has the digitizer built into the system that helps with knowing where all of that goes. So of course, 90% of you chose digitizer. You got that one absolutely correct. Now, why would it not be an inverter? 
Inverters are commonly associated with the screens, especially laptop screens. But inverters were only used for the older laptop screens that had a cold cathode fluorescent lamp behind it. Those fluorescent tubes needed AC power, but your laptop had DC power, so it converted the DC back to AC to only give you light on the backlight. If that sounds like it's an extra step that perhaps would be unnecessary today, you're right, because today we have LEDs that use DC power, so you no longer need those inverters in your system. It makes it very easy to make that happen. The inverters are pretty useful on laptops, and you'll if you have an older laptop and suddenly the backlight goes out, it might be because the inverter has failed. If you have a newer laptop, there are no inverters. There's no re need to invert from DC to AC. We simply use the DC that's built into and already on the motherboard of that laptop to be able to brighten the backlight of the LCD panel that's in front of you. So that's why inverter would not be the right answer. USB interfaces have nothing to do with a stylus on the screen. USB isn't used at all, so we wouldn't use choose that one either. Your system RAM is certainly an important resource on your system. And if you run out of system RAM, you will have a lot of problems with the applications you're trying to use, but it probably would not manifest itself through your stylus no longer working on your screen. That's not really the most likely failed component in our list of, of failed components. And an M.2 drive, if your M.2 drive fails, you're probably not going to have many things working on your system. Uh, the, the stylus on your screen is the least of your worries at that point and probably not causing a problem with stylus interface. It's really causing a problem with the applications and data being able to work properly on your system. So digitizer, the obvious right answer here. 90% of you chose digitizer. You got that one absolutely right. So folks in the chat room were asking about what do you mean DC power? What do you mean AC power? Now you need to jump over to the power section of my videos where I talk about using power on these systems, what a power supply inside of a system does, how it converts from the AC power at your uh, at your um, on the side outside of your computer to the DC power that's inside of your computer. There's a lot of information to go through there. I've got a whole ser series of videos on that one that are part of the 1101A plus course. Let's, uh, you did great on this one, by the way. So let's do another question. We're going to move to a different topic. And it asks, a technician is configuring a tablet to receive email messages from the ISP's server. Which of the following port numbers would commonly be used? So you thought you were going to know this one here for a moment. You thought I was going to ask about protocols. No, I already asked about protocols. I want more information from you. A technician is configuring a tablet to receive email messages from the ISP server. In a way, I've given you a little bit of information already. Which of the following port numbers would commonly be used? Is it 3389, 67, 143, 22, or 389? Which one is it? Now, if you know the answer, of course, no answers in the chat room, no hints in the chat room. You want to go to the link that's on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, and lock in your answers. So I think you might have at least half of this question already, but you don't have the second half. That's the part you have to fill in. Hopefully, you're familiar with your port numbers. You can see we've already moved from section one to section two of your exam objectives. I guess CompTIA calls them domain one and domain two. Uh, that is the part we're on right now is domain two. It's the networking part. And port numbers are, although it seems that they are rote memorization, and in many ways they are something that you have to memorize, those of you that have already been working on these and, and working through them, it, you already know that the questions and the things you're working through are uh, are coming directly from the exam objectives. So go to the objectives if you ever have any of those available. Folks in the chat room are asking, can I use my own port chart during the test? Only if you write that port chart out after the test has started. You're not able to take anything into the exam. You're not able to take any study materials into the exam, any charts into the exam. They do give you a single sheet of paper or or an erasable page with a erasable marker if you are in person at a testing center. If you're taking this at home, they give you an online sort of a notepad that you can put things into. But you're not able to put anything into the notepad. You're not able to write anything on the page until your 90-minute timer has started for the exam. So that's that's the important part. So if you remember all the port numbers, you could list them all out on that piece of paper and then go ahead. But 
the list of port numbers on your exam relatively small based on all the other data that you're going to need to know for this exam. So there's a lot more objectives on the exam than just port numbers. Try not to get wrapped around the axle. Try not to focus laser focus on one single set of objectives and ignore everything around it because in reality they could be asking you about everything around it and might never get to the point where they're asking you about port numbers. So that's another important part of it. Make sure you're familiar. Let's see how you did with this one. The question asks, a technician is configuring a tablet to receive email messages from the ISP server. Which of the following port numbers would commonly be used? Would it be 3389, 67, 143, 22, or 389? Let's see what you chose as your answer. We'll show the results, and you can see 74% of you, a strong number, say it's 143 is the port number. And then it's effectively a four-way tie for second place with 389, 22, 3389, and 67 being the other options, which are 8, 7, 6, and 5% each respectively. So the real port number we were looking for kind of focuses on transferring email messages from a server at our internet service provider to a tablet that we are using locally. And you would use probably one of two different protocols to do this. You would use either POP3 or IMAP. Those sound familiar? We've already talked about these two protocols already today. POP3 obviously is the post office protocol, version 3. It uses TCP port 110 to communicate. And as you can tell in our multiple choice question, 110 is not one of those options. So we were probably not using POP3 for this particular transfer. But there are other ways to transfer emails from one device to another. IMAP4 is another way to do that. Internet Message Access Protocol version 4 uses TCP 143. And that allows you to not only transfer emails, but also keep everything synchronized on a centralized server so that you can uh, really go to any device you're using and everything is synced up if you're using IMAP4. TCP 143 is the default port used for IMAP. And 143 indeed, 73% of you chose option C, which is 143 for IMAP4. That is the right answer. These other port numbers that are here are real port numbers that are used for SSH, DHCP, LDAP, uh, uh, Microsoft's directory remote, uh, remote desktop protocol. There are a lot of different protocols listed here. You really do need to go back and forth over those as to which ones are used for which particular port numbers and in which use cases you would make those happen. That is the list that's here. They are all real port numbers you need to know. If you don't recognize any of them, then you'll know to go right back and figure out what the different options are for those particular port numbers. In this case, port 143 correlates back to IMAP4, and that is the protocol we would use to transfer information from an internet service provider's email box down to a tablet that you happen to be using. So one of the things you probably have noticed already is there's a lot of information on these exams. It is a very broad exam. It goes a little bit deep, but not too deep for each of these topics. But it's a very broad set of topics that we need to know. Everything from cloud computing to security to operating systems to Linux. We're talking about hardware and networking. And you can see port numbers. There's so many different things that you might work through. So working with and understanding what's in these videos is going to be very helpful to you because we are laser focused on giving you videos that go through every topic of the exam objectives and really nothing else. That's really our goal here is to give you exactly what you need to know to pass this exam. So that is the one you would use. But notice that for A+, it's 137 videos, 19 hours of information. And although I would recommend you go through all 19 hours to be able to use this. Not everybody has that kind of time. Not everybody has the ability to go through all of those. And so one of the things you might want to consider is getting some notes to go along with the videos. My set of course notes include every bit of information that is in my videos, all of the text, all of the important graphics, all everything that you would need to be able to pass your exam. Here's the PDF version of my course notes. We'll just flip through the first few pages here and you can start to see all of that text, all those important graphics, all of the 
tables that I've created, the port numbers, and everything else is in these course notes. They are designed to give you that single point to go to to summarize everything that you've already learned from your books, from your videos, from practice exams. It's now in one place, and it gives you a very quick way to reference those pieces of information if you happen to be on the go. So if you are reading at work, if you are uh, uh, on a train, if you're sitting at home and you just want a summary of what's on the exam, my course notes have exactly that information. This course notes are available on my website, professormesser.com slash 1101 notes, something you can purchase to help support what we do on the website. And I think something you can purchase to help you pass these exams as well. That's a win-win in my book. Have a look at those. See if it's something that might help you. Go to professormesser.com slash 1101 notes. Let's do some more questions. Got another one for you. We will roll this one up. Uh, the then folks are even have already gone there and are looking at those and go, what about the audio bundle? What's that? It's all of my videos, but I've taken all of the audio and created MP3s of them. So if you're at the gym and you're working out, and you just want some audio to go through those videos, that audio you can load up as an MP3 and it takes up less room on your mobile device. So that is the same uh, YouTube videos in an MP3 format. Let's give you another question. I've got more here. This next question, a USB question. It asks... None of the USB interfaces on the front of a desktop case will recognize when a USB device is connected. Which of the following components is the most likely source of this issue? Is the problem with the pin header, an eSATA interface, the ATX plus 12 volt power, CPU speed, or out of memory? None of the USB interfaces on the front of a desktop case will recognize when a USB device is connected. Which of the following components is the most likely source of this issue? Is it pin header, eSATA interface, ATX 12 volt power, CPU speed, or out of memory? One of these has got to be the most likely reason for this problem. If you think you know the answer, lock in your answer. Go to professormesser.com slash QA. That will lock it all in for you. So folks are asking, do the course notes have audio? Well, the course notes are taken from the videos. The videos have audio. Therefore, I guess the course notes would have audio. I don't think that's what you were asking. though. <laughs> I think you were asking for something else. The course notes do not have audio. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to simply say what's in the notes because they're notes. It's not a book. It's not a video. It's a set of notes. Literally notes taken from my course. Those are my course notes. Um, and so I didn't make an audiobook version of my course notes because it just would it would sound funny. It would be weird. So no, they are not there. If you want if you want something that kind of explains information but in an audio form, those would be my MP3 audio files. That's probably the best way to do it. See if you're familiar with these answers. In fact, all five of these answers are things that can go wrong on your system. So we'll see if this is something that you are familiar with step through these folks in the chat room ask if i'll do project plus probably never what an awful thing to have to go through project plus i'm so sorry you have to do that you have my condolences and i know that there are a lot of training facilities and universities that want you to take and pass project plus which is great if you're going to be a project manager but we're here to work in it so it doesn't really fit the whole scheme of getting a job or getting a better job because Project Plus is not going to get you a job or a better job in the world of IT. It'll get you a job or a better job in the world of project management, but that's not what we do here. We're not a project management site. So there's plenty of great project man management sites out there, though. I've seen them. Uh, some good stuff there. It's all That is a science unto itself, for sure. So no, no Project Plus here. No Data Plus. Another one that's not an IT uh, certification. Those are more uh, outside the scope of IT. In, in my uh, humble opinion, anyway. So let's see what you think of this question. It asks, none of the USB interfaces on a front of a desktop case will recognize when a USB device is connected, which is, I don't know, half the time when I'm plugging something in. Which of the following components is the most likely source of the issue? Is it a pin header, an eSATA interface, an ATX 12 volt power, CPU speed, or out of memory? What did you choose? Let's find out what you chose. 63% say it's a pin header. 25% of you say it's the E SATA interface. You know that E is for external. You've got 8% that said ATX 12 volt power. 3% say you're out of memory. And 0% say it's anything to do 
with the CPU speed. Well, if we went with the majority here, 63% say it's pin header. And if I had to choose myself, I would also choose pin header. What, the, what is a pin header? You mean like a pin head? Isn't that an insult? No, it's a pin header. It's an actual component on the motherboard of your system. It has these tiny little pins on it. There they are. These tiny little pins are set up so that you can easily plug in a wire that will then connect back usually to an interface, a button, or some other type of physical component. And you can see these particular pin headers on here even have the name of them, the USB. These are USB pin headers that we can see listed here. There's a, one with a speaker and other components, uh, status lights, and other things on that pin header. So you have to look closely at the motherboard to know what these pins do when you're working through this. So make sure you're familiar with all of these little pins, where they are. You probably have to check the documentation of your motherboard or look at the motherboard itself, and it will tell you if it happens to have any of these pins and what they happen to be. It's probably even marked on the motherboard. Here's a pin header for a TPM, a Trusted Platform Module. Here's one for USB 2, USB 1, USB 3.0. So there's a faster USB headers here, very different than the older style. Notice they use more pins on the USB 3.0 versus the older USB connections. That's where you would have the biggest problem if you're not getting a light to, light to turn on in your external case. If there's an interface that's not working, if there's a button that's not working, it's probably because there is a pin problem connecting to the pin header. That's the first place you want to go. Might have been pulled out the last time you disconnected your motherboard case, or maybe it's loose. We can find all of those in this list and be able to break those down. A quarter of you said... An eSATA interface is probably our problem. eSATA, of course, is a standard for connecting storage devices using the SATA protocol, the serial ATA protocol, and it's outside of your case. So it's the eSATA version of this particular connector type, which is perfect if we were plugging in an external hard drive or an external SSD. Uh, in this particular case, though, we don't commonly connect USB drives to an eSATA interface. Almost every USB drive I've run into has a USB connector on it because it's literally called a USB drive. I don't know. Maybe those matching terms there make sense to me. The, the challenge, though, is you will occasionally run into an eSATA drive, and you're going to need to plug into an eSATA interface. That's eSATA interface different slightly than the SATA interfaces that are inside of your computer case on the motherboard. So a little bit different, a little, little slight difference between SATA and eSATA, and neither of those is used when you're plugging in an e, a USB interface. So would not be eSATA, would not be the choice we would want to use. ATX 12-volt power, useful for powering additional uh, adapter cards that you've installed into a system but usually have nothing to do with the USB interfaces that you're plugging in on the front of the computer. USB doesn't need a lot of power to be able to run, so you're probably not going to need ATX 12-volt power on there. 3% of you said out of memory. If you're out of memory, as we mentioned earlier, the least of your problems is plugging in your USB drive. Your whole system is going to have a problem, so probably not what you would work through. And then lastly, CPU speed. Nobody chose CPU speed because it generally does not have any problems associated with anything that you'd be plugging into. USB is uh, is pretty much how you would focus on those. So hopefully that that's something you are familiar with, one that you were able to use. And obviously pin header was our correct answer here. If you've never seen those pin headers, they're absolutely in my uh, video with all of those graphics you just saw. That would be a great place to go to be able to understand more about pin headers and how they work. If you're watching this video for Continuing Education Unit Credit, or CEUs, this means you already have your A-plus certification and you're looking to collect CEUs to renew, I would be glad to send you an email that gives you a one-hour webinar category CEU. This uh, email would be sent to you with a digital signature so you know it came from me and you know the information that's in the email has not changed since the time I sent it, but obviously are two of the most important parts of a digital signature. That is available if you follow these steps. You must follow these steps to earn your CEU email. You go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. There's a link there for Contact Us. 
That Contact Us link will bring up a form where you can put in your name, your email address. In the subject line, please put May 2023 Core 1. And in the body of the message, put a note by itself or, or a, on a line by itself, put the words pin header. Our super secret code word of the month is pin header that we are looking for. 64% of you chose that option, so why not use it as our super secret code word of the month? You can send that email to me, simply submit it. If you'd like to put anything else in there, that I'd, I'd love reading through these. So any other messages you put would be great to see underneath that line that has the words pin header by itself. And that uh, means in about a week, I can turn these around, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. I'll get these emails sent off to you so that you have some documentation that you really were here for these study groups. For those of you who want that again, go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website, click Contact Us, put your name, your email address, put May 2023, Core 1, and in the body of the message on a line by itself, put the words pin header. There you go. That is where you want to be. So hopefully that would be exactly where you can focus on learning all of these. Let's do some more. We have some time for more questions. So let's step through another question that we happen to have here. This next question is listed here with this option. A software installation fails with the message AMDV not enabled. What type of software is most likely being installed? Is that an SNMP agent, a hypervisor, an email service, a web server, or a certificate authority? A software installation fails with the message AMDV not enabled. What type of software is most likely being installed? Is that an SNMP agent, hypervisor, email service, web server, or certificate authority? Do you think you know the answer? Please don't answer in the chat room. You want to instead go to this link here, professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer and see if you happen to know what this one is. If you think you're familiar with this technology, have a look at what it happens to be. This is one that all five of these are technologies you need to be aware of. So make sure you know what those are. This is probably one of the really most important set of questions because you're going to install an application. It gives some type of error. Why did it give that error? These are very common things to be asked on the exam. So make sure you're familiar with those on the exam. And I think that will help you as you step through this. I think that's probably, uh, if you're ever focusing on topics for the exam, there's an entire section on troubleshooting. So step through each one of those troubleshooting scenarios and become more familiar with how those might manifest themselves, how you might recognize that that particular problem exists. Uh, and, and that was going to help you on the exam as well. This is a question that really does focus on that type of data. A software installation fails with the message AMDV not enabled. What type of software is most likely being installed? Is it an SNP agent, a hypervisor, an email service, a web server, or a certificate authority? And let's see what you chose for this one. You see that 82% of you say it's hypervisor. 11% though say it's a certificate authority. And then we have single digits for SNMP agent, email service, or web server. Well, this is, this is one of those examples where whenever you're installing a piece of software, there are certain requirements to that software to have it work properly. Sometimes these requirements are relatively straightforward. You need a certain amount of memory and a certain amount of storage space free. And that's it. That's your only requirement for that software. But other software might require a different library to be installed onto your computer. Maybe there's a runtime engine that needs to be installed. Maybe it requires that you connect a physical dongle or USB interface into the back for licensing. So you, there's a lot of different hardware and software requirements when you're installing software. One of, the soft, one of the software or configuration requirements for software that you might find is when you're installing something for uh, virtualization. Virtualization requires uh, a lot of complexity underneath the surface, especially if there's an operating system running along with it. And that complexity takes the place uh, or really requires you to use all of the 
virtualization features available on your computer. Our modern CPUs have built into the hardware of the CPU themselves additional hardware to support these virtualization software systems. And AMD V is a perfect example of this. You'll find it on AMD chips. If you're using an Intel chip, then you're looking for a technology called VT or virtualization technology. That is something that commonly is enabled or disabled in the hardware of your system. So you can turn that on and turn it off, usually in your UEFI BIOS. There is Obviously, other requirements, too. You'll need to check the memory and the drive space and how the network is configured. But for the purposes of our question, we were getting a message saying AMD V is not enabled. What we're probably installing in that case is software used for virtualization. And the software virtualization management is this type of software we refer to as a hypervisor. 82% of you chose hypervisor. That is the right answer. That's the one we were looking for. It would not be a certificate authority. Certificate authorities don't need any type of additional virtualization functionality. AMD V would not need to be enabled if you are running a certificate authority. You also don't need AMD V if you're running SNMP or an SNMP agent on your system. It doesn't use anything with virtualization. So SNMP agents would not use AMDV. And the same thing applies for a web server or an email service. If you're simply installing web server software or email service software, those don't tend to have any hooks into the virtual environment that's on your system. So AMDV would not be required. The only software here that makes any sense would be answer B, hypervisor. That was the one we were looking for, and 82% of you got that one absolutely correct. Well done. Well, what would be a study group if we didn't have a printer question? So let's do a printer question as our next question on the study group. Here is the question we're looking for. Each time a user prints, a message on the printer shows load tray three plain letter. Which of the following is the most likely reason for this message? Is it because of corrupted network traffic, a bad printer cable, low toner, the fuser is faulty, or incorrect printer defaults. Each time a user prints, a message on the printer shows load tray three plain letter. Which of the following is the most likely reason for this message? Is it corrupted network traffic, a bad printer cable, low toner, the fuser is faulty, or incorrect printer defaults? It's one of those. If you think you know the answer, follow the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. It does feel good to be a gangster, doesn't it? There's there's lots of references in this one question. We could we could go on all day on this question, uh, but it should be relatively straightforward. All five of these are pretty bad, by the way. We don't you know if you have corrupted network traffic, a bad printer cable, low toner fusers, faulty or incorrect printer defaults, they're all things you don't want. But which one of those is causing this particular problem? Hopefully, you can turn that around. And it's important on this question that you do not jump to conclusions. Just just giving you that that little tip, that little little piece of information that might help you. It doesn't help you at all, actually. But it, it was very self-gratifying to myself. So that's that's just you're gonna have to work through that. Uh, when you when you get when you get through the the other parts of this question. See if you can parse out what we're trying to do here. So each time a user prints a message on the printer shows load tray three plain letter. Which of the following is the most likely reason for this message? Is it corrupted network traffic, a bad printer cable, low toner, the fuser is faulty, or incorrect printer defaults? Let's see what you chose for this one. Another one where a lot of people focused on one single answer. 83% of you say it's incorrect printer defaults. 10% of you, just barely double digits, say it's low toner. I think we've all been the low toner route before, haven't we? 3% say the fuser's faulty. 2% say corrupted network traffic. And 1% said bad printer cable. It's effectively a three-way tie for third place. In this case, 84% is a pretty strong number here. And what if you did have a printer that said, Load tray three plain letter. There it is right there on the printer. Uh, gosh, what could that be? It's saying that what I'm trying to print is not associated with the tray of paper that happens to be in the printer. 
you're going to need to load a different paper size to be able to get this to print. Except, no, you are printing to plain letter. This is, for some reason, there's a mismatch between what you've told the printer to print on and what the printer actually has available to it. At least the printer's smart enough to tell us something doesn't connect. Something's not jiving right between what you told me to print and what I'm trying to print. So what we want to do is perhaps have a look at what we're printing. Are we printing to a different tray than we thought? Are we printing to a different type of paper than what we thought? Because the printer knows what type of paper and what's loaded in it. And if we try to print a different size piece to a letter, it will give us a, an unusual message on the screen that stops everything and says, here's your chance to fix this problem. Take out this tray, put in a correct tray, and we'll be able to print the thing you asked for. And if it's something where, no, that is what I asked for, I shouldn't have to print go, I shouldn't have to replace the printer tray, then it's probably something that is misconfigured either as the defaults on the printer or in the driver that you happen to be using. So there's two places you can really go to sync up this. Make sure that the driver you're using is set up properly and is associated with the correct model of printer that you're printing to. And make sure that the driver has listed the correct trays that are on the printer. Could be that the printer is misconfigured with what trays it thinks are available. So whenever you get that, and maybe in this case you push go, you just say resume, and it prints normally, then you know something is not quite right with the way the driver is talking to the printer or the way the printer is configured to re react from information that's being sent from the driver. Those are pretty important messages. Make sure you're familiar with the incorrect paper size. I've got an entire video on troubleshooting printers on the 1101 section 5.6, which is aptly named Troubleshooting Printers. That's the name of the printer troubleshooting video that's really going to help you as you step through these. And indeed, we had 85% of you that said, yeah, troubleshooting the printer. We get this message. It's probably a configuration issue. And you're probably right. It's absolutely a configuration issue and something you may be able to help with, uh, something fix or be able to replace back and forth with those. And if, if, and if that doesn't work, there's always a baseball bat. That's, that's the only thing that I think, I don't know where I learned that, but I know that there, that is one method for resolving that type of problem. Well, as you can tell, we've already gone through a number of questions in here. There were a few people earlier that said, how can I get more questions? How can I really go through and understand questions that really are focused on the exam objectives, that don't go out of scope to previous versions of the exam, that are written by someone who's been through these problems before and who, as a technologist, really understands the nuances of both the questions and the answers provided to you, and perhaps questions that are built and have the same style or nuance as the actual questions you would get on your exam. I would argue that there's no other place to get that on the internet except on professormesser.com on the set of practice questions that I have personally written myself. These practice questions, the books are 389 pages. It's a big book. You can see that's a, that is a thick book of questions because there are three complete practice exams in this book. 90 questions in each one of the practice exams has multiple choice questions in here. It has performance-based questions in here. The questions that are in this book you've never seen before. These are not our, our study group questions. These are these are are exam level questions. These have the same style, the same word play, the same type of questions, the same voice, if you will, or at least as as close as I could get to the actual exam without making it actual exam questions, because obviously that would not be something you would want. Uh, and even more so, the questions are built with some extra things inside. Let me show you what I mean. I have one of these questions up on my screen. Let's go through it. Again, no answers in the chat room. We'll figure out what these happen to be. A16 is the question we'll look at. The question asks, when a user starts their computer, the screen remains blank and the computer beeps twice. Which of these would be the most likely cause of this issue? The boot device is not connected. The memory is faulty. The operating system has become corrupted. Or the PC is infected with malware. Now, if we just want the answer, you can, of course, because this is a PDF, I could choose my PDF uh, um, tools here to 
annotate what's on the screen and be able to perhaps mark down information that I might have there. If you do have a tablet with a stylus, you can even write on the PDF. There's nothing in the PDF preventing you from doing that. You'll also notice that I have answers on here. You can go to page 31. If you just want to know A, B, C, or D, I'll tell you. But I think what most people will probably do is go to page 51. Now, we're on page 8 right now. But you don't want to scroll, 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 and then have to scroll back every time. So instead, I've built links into the PDF. We can just click right here where it says the details, and it takes me to a page, 51, that has the question again. And it tells you that the answer is the memory is faulty. And then I give you an explanation as to why that is the correct response. Now, if you're like me, you take these practice exams, and you never get the right answer. But then it never tells you why you didn't get the right answer. And I think that's a great opportunity to learn more about the topics we need to know for the exam. The only time you ever learn is when you get the question wrong. So why not give feedback when the question is wrong? So in my practice exams book, every incorrect answer is fully documented to explain why this is not the correct answer for this particular question. And I would highly recommend, if you already have this book and you've gone through it and you've gotten the questions right, I highly recommend you read through the wrong answers. Just because on your actual exam, they may be asking you a question about boot devices not connected, or the operating systems becoming corrupted, or the PC being infected with malware. So there's a good chance for you to learn even more about these topics associated with every single question that's in here. And if you read the question and you still don't know what's going on, I've been there, at the very bottom of this, I have a QR code and direct links in the PDF itself that will take you to the video that created that, that was used to create this question to begin with. So you always have this feedback loop all the way through the question, the answers, and then back to the question again, so that if any part of this journey is confusing, you've missed some data, you want to know more about the topic, there's always a way to get that information, either from within the PDF itself or externally on the videos that are available on the Professor Messer website. And once we're done here, I can click the back button in my PDF reader. I'm back to where I started, and we can go to the next question on my list. Those are my practice exams. Those books are available in a digital form. That's the digital edition on my website, or a physical edition. That's the physical printed book that I can ship to you. If you purchase the physical edition, you get the digital edition for free. So while you're waiting for this to be delivered, you can easily download the PDF and start using it right away. It's an immediate download. Find it on my website, professormesser.com slash core1pe, or simply use the links on my website on the menus to find the practice exams for core one, core two, or for both. I also want to tell you, I mentioned this earlier, the objectives are free on the CompTIA website. They are the very first thing you should be downloading before you start your studies. They should be the last thing you refer to before you go in. There were a number of people that were sending messages earlier, questions that we just haven't had time to go back. We'll address them in the after show. But those questions were asking about, I've got my exam in a couple of days. I've got my exam next week. What should I do to study? We should download these exam objectives if you don't have them already. And you should go through every single bullet in the exam objectives. Here's the objectives. And if you look at these objectives, they're extensive. So for instance, let's go to uh, section 2.4, summarize, summarize services provided by networked host, server roles, DNS, DHCP, file share, print servers, mail servers, syslog, web servers, AAA servers. What are those? How do they work? When would I use them? Where do they where do they fit on the network? What about internet appliances like spam gateways, unified threat management, or UTM devices, load balancers, proxy servers? And then you've, you've got even more here. Every bullet that's in this list are things you should know for the exam. So make sure you're familiar with everything in the exam objectives. They are such a critical part of your studies, and they're free. Find a link over to the CompTIA website by visiting professormesser.com slash objectives. We do one of these study groups every month. Uh, this month, we do our A-plus study group for Core 1 today. Come back on Thursday, two days from now. We're doing our Core 2 study group. Next week on Wednesday is our Network Plus study group. And a week after that is our Security Plus study group. It's a similar for June. You can see I've got the dates for June up here. You've also got uh, June 6th and 8th for A-plus, June 14th for Network Plus, June 21st for Security Plus. These dates are always subject to change. There's, of course, the chaos in my life will sometimes move these dates around. And if that happens, 
you will always see the updates immediately on my website by visiting professormesser.com slash calendar. We also have an events calendar in our Discord. I synchronize both of those at the same time. So if you're ever wondering when is the next live event for this thing, simply visit professormesser.com slash calendar or look at the events link that is in our Discord. I usually will have the calendar looking about two months out, and the Discord usually is the current month or the next 30 days, uh, just so you're aware of the differences with the events and when they are happening. That's a great place to find out. And if you're ever wondering, you're watching this six months from now, wondering, well, when is the next event? Go to professormesser.com slash calendar. It'll be there and waiting for you. Well, that's an hour of Q&A already, but we've got more. Stick around. I'll be answering your questions in our after show. Don't go anywhere. I'll be watching the chat as it goes by. And we'll answer the questions that you have about the A+, about IT, about technology, or about life in general. I answer whatever questions you might have out there, almost any question you might have out there. Don't forget about our vouchers that come with our free exam hacks ebook. Go to professormesser.com slash vouchers and don't pay full price for your voucher. Get a discount of voucher. You don't need a special code. You don't need a coupon code. You don't need an extension in your browser. You simply visit the website. Go to professormesser.com slash vouchers and bring home that free exam hacks ebook. It might give you those extra points you need on the exam. Uh, there's some great tips in there that can help you as well. Don't forget about our practice exams, our course notes, and so much more on our site. It really helps keep all, all of this uh, craziness going, keeps the lights on. Go to professormesser.com slash 1101success. And thank you for those of you who have already done that. You uh, very much appreciate your support of what we do here. Hopefully it's giving you some things that are going to help you get your exam passed the first time taking that exam. And don't forget about all the things we do. We're not live. Go to Twitter, go to Facebook, go to Instagram, go to LinkedIn, go to YouTube. Simply type in professormesser.com slash Instagram, slash YouTube, slash LinkedIn, slash all of those. Uh, think of something I haven't even said yet. Slash, put that in. See if I'm there. We'll know, we'll know where that's going to be. That's a great place to go as well. Plenty to look at that is available on that list. We'd love for you to, uh, to subscribe and join us on those social media sites. Stick around for the after show. I got a lot of Q&A coming up right after that. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for joining us in this first hour. And we'll see you next time on the A-plus study group. Okay, let's take a sip. Let's talk about some of the things you're talking about in our chat room. Let me bring this up. There we go. Hi, everybody. Let's bring the chat over. I want to answer your questions now. So if you are here live and online, you're on YouTube. There's a YouTube chat. That's the chat I'm looking at. If you're on my website at professormesser.com slash live, you'll notice there is an embedded chat on my page. It's the same chat. So you don't even have to leave that page. I'm watching the questions go by. If you have questions that you would like to ask, you can do it right there on the chat. We've got a lot of questions to go through. And this, the question, first question is, oh, are we done with the questions? Well, we're done with the questions that I ask. We're now starting in with the questions that you ask. So we'll have to see which ones are available to have. That's exactly where you go for some of those. Hopefully that can help you. Uh, let's start off with an easy question because there's no wrong answer. I like those. Our first question uh, from Easy, speaking of being an easy question from Easy in Austin, says, what's your favorite thing to work on in IT? That's a, that is actually a, I don't want to say that's a tough question, but that is, that is a tough question. Uh, in my career, I have worked with, uh, at, at hardware fix repair as a field service technician. I've worked on corporate help desks, uh, designing and setting up the Windows operating system and implementing and installing those automatically, putting patches and antivirus and all of those things. I've worked in networking, designing and implementing large-scale enterprise networks. I've done tons of routing and switching. And in my last job working for a, a corporation, a third-party corporation, it was as a systems engineer for Next Generation Firewall. So those are sort of the, the different things that I've done in my career. I would have to say, and it's probably because it was the last one I had, my last job working at Palo Alto Networks as a systems engineer was by far the most fun I've ever had in an IT job. And there's probably a number of reasons because of that. 
probably the thing that that was the spark for that position, the one that really got me excited about that position, is it was working with a technology that at the time was brand new. No one had ever seen it because it did not exist prior to Palo Alto Networks introducing this to the world. Uh, next generation firewalls were not a thing. Nobody knew them. They, they didn't even, in many cases, believe that an next generation firewall could do what we said it did. And that was perhaps the most fun, was when you walk into a place, you say, uh, are you having a problem with this? Are you having challenges with this? Boy, do I have something that you're going to love. And I explain what a next generation firewall does. And quite literally, for the first year of going out to customers and talking to them about this technology, they would stare at us and go, no, we don't think so. That's a lovely story. We get lots of people coming in here all the time telling us great stories, and we don't believe you. And so, of course, I would have one that I could pull out or ship in or bring in as an evaluation. And it was always great fun to plug those into a network and start seeing the information that's going across someone's network. And because these next generation firewalls were able to see information that nobody else could see, it's amazing when you plug into a network the things that would pop up. Now, imagine being in a meeting with the security professionals for a major Fortune 100 company. You are plugging in this next generation firewall for the first time, and immediately you see applications, data files, and URLs that would be not just not safe for work, but in some cases, um, they would be not appropriate to use for corporate environments. And in even worse cases, someone would be doing something literally illegal on the network that you would never be able to see prior to this. But by plugging in one of these next generation firewalls, you see everything. And this brings up a, a number of challenges. We've talked about this on our Security Plus study group, is sometimes as a security professional, you are put in the position to, to have to deal with some very uncomfortable topics when you're working on a network because occasionally you will run into very uncomfortable things. And there were a couple of meetings during my seven years with that company where we saw things that we had to contact authorities to be able to resolve. And I have had, unfortunately, customers of mine that have gone to prison because of things they were doing on the network. And thankfully, we were able to find these things. Thankfully, we were able to find this illegal traffic and the people who were responsible for it had to deal with the consequences of that. That's just IT. That's just being an, a security professional in our world today. So uh, obviously, the vast majority of things we would do day to day never got to that very serious level. Most of it was people visiting websites they probably shouldn't be doing and kind of slap them on the wrist and go, no, no, don't go there. Uh, or be able to implement controls to prevent somebody from going to those sites from the very beginning. So those are great things to do. Those are they're great tasks with IT and things that I would say were a lot of fun was working with that technology. I think security probably gave me that the, the most interesting part of that. One of the things I always found interesting, though, and, and maybe this wasn't a security related thing, was when I first got into networking, one of the very first technologies I ever saw uh, that that really got me excited about networking was a sniffer. A sniffer is sort of a generic term we use these days, but it, it actually relates to a specific product at that time when it was manufactured by Network General. And uh, the company I worked for had bought one. This is like a $10,000 investment at the time. You plug this device into the network and it shows you every packet going over the wire. And I know everybody today is like, well, yeah, it's Wireshark. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. You just do that. It's free. At the time, there was no Wireshark. There was no way to do this unless you wrote it yourself. So we got the sniffer, and I could see all of the traffic going across the network. I could see there were protocols. I could see there was different protocols doing different things. And immediately, I was entranced by this. I wanted to know more about what's going on under the wire that I can't see with my, my human eye, but this device can suddenly show me all of this data going back and forth. That was when I first started getting into networking. That was probably the second most exciting part of my career is working with that technology, becoming familiar with it. And, and in fact, working with that foundational packet capture protocol analysis technology allowed me to leverage that knowledge into positions that got me into working at 
Network General, working at Palo Alto Networks, working in some of these larger companies where I was dealing with security, networking, protocols, and putting it all together into one place. And eventually in your career in IT, you will be getting to that point where suddenly these things are going to start tying together. And the closer they tie together and the more they tie together with the knowledge you already have, the more uh, money you'll be able to ask for in your job, the more jobs will be available to you. It's a great way to leverage the knowledge you have and to become more knowledgeable with the technologies that you're going to run into day to day. So that's a, that's a very long answer to, hey, what do you, what do you like there? What, what, what's your favorite stuff? But that is a, a pretty good example uh, of those to have your work through. Um, so we'll circle back to my practice exams real quick because uh, Dave WZ asked, do the practice exam questions come with the answers at the end of the book? Well, they do. It's really more they come inside the book with links at the end of the book that I have the book up. I think I did. So I don't have a way to kind of show this on the screen, or do I? Uh, I showed you when we were going through the question that the answers were on page 51. And I kind of clicked the answers. So this is page 51. It's in the back of the book, or it's really in the back of the test. And I have three tests, and it's the back of every test. So yes, the questions and the answers and everything you need are in the book. Yes, that's an interesting question. Wouldn't that be an awful practice exam book? Maybe I should publish a practice exam book with none of the answers. <laughs> That'd be the worst book ever. Uh, so no, mine is only the second worst book ever because I did put the answers at the end of the book. So at least I know it's at least second best. Maybe it's better, but at least it's not the worst, right? Because it does have the answers, absolutely. Uh, that would be good to have. Um, other questions. And it, I find it weird, though, and, and you obviously don't, I, uh, or you do, and you're kind of making the point. A lot of practice exams don't put a lot of information in for the answer. Some just put the letter. It, it was B. All right, but why was it B? And why was it not A, C, or D? Those are the questions I think we need to be answering, and that's those are the questions this book absolutely answers. Um, other questions. Let's keep going uh, through our list. Um, other things. Um, so this is more of a question about more of a career question. I think it's worthwhile to step through, kind of break down how to get from point A to point B in this in unusual career of IT. Uh, the question from KB asks, I'm looking to quickly get a cloud security related job. Excellent. Never been in IT before. That's fine. Been studying for the A plus a couple of months. Sh but should I go in the order of network plus and then some type of cloud based certification? The, the challenge with the cloud is that it's everything we do outside the cloud in another place. So everything about operating systems, everything you need to know about networking, everything about security and databases and uptime and availability, patching, and everything you have to know on a physical server sitting in front of you is very similar to the information you need to know in the cloud, plus even more because you've got that cloud piece kind of wrapped around all of these services that you're providing. And when you move services from your private network into a, a relatively public or at least potentially public infrastructure like the public cloud, there are some significant security concerns you have to, of course, keep in mind. So cloud security is a great place to go if you're interested in that line of it. But of course, you might just be interested in automation of the cloud. Maybe you're interested in designing cloud-based application instances. Maybe you want to create uh, some automation, or in the world of cloud, an orchestration that is able to manipulate or change the type of cloud services you're providing at any particular time and do it automatically. Those are great services. And someone who's worked in security, security in the cloud, of course, is, is another set of jobs unto itself. There's, there are jobs where people all people do is manage the permissions and rights of people gaining access to application instances that are in the cloud. So the cloud really opens up IT to many different additional fields of study. But let's break this down into really just the security side of things. And, and I, will, I will give you my broad uh, understanding of where I believe the industry sits as far as security is concerned. And I, I look forward to your cards and letters telling me I'm wrong, but I'm not. Uh, the question about, the, in this case, is really speaking specifically the cloud 
security and it's someone who doesn't have experience in IT before, which is perfectly reasonable. And there may be some entry level jobs in a cloud based infrastructure that may or may not be security related. And probably in most cases they are not. But if you're working in a, a security operations center, a network operations center, that would be a SOC or a NOC, uh, maybe you're working with a company that has a large cloud based infrastructure and you're just simply expected to know how to use this infrastructure and be able to work with it. But once you have that foundational knowledge, now you have to be able to secure it. So before you can secure anything, you need to understand how it works. So before you can truly secure the cloud, you have to understand how the cloud works. Well, in the cloud, we've got networking components. We've got operating systems. We've got middleware or databases or some other type of storage mechanism. So you've got all of these different technologies in the cloud. So how do you find a way to use that towards a job in cloud security? Well, first, you need some understanding of these operating systems so that you can secure them. Then you need to understand how the network operates so you can use those network technologies to better secure those application instances. And then finally, you're ready for a cloud security position. So it's more of a path to be able to get to that level than someone just starting out. A lot of people don't realize that IT security, cloud security, or really sort of cyber security in general, really expects that you have an existing foundation in these technologies. Otherwise, you're not going to be very good at securing it. So I would highly recommend if you want to get into IT security, you want to learn more about managing firewalls, you want to work with SIMs, you want to build policies, you want to implement AAA services, you want to put VPN technologies, you want to do all of these different security things, you're probably going to want to get a strong foundation in operating systems and a strong foundation in networking before you're able to qualify for those particular positions. So if you are familiar with Windows or you'd like to get a Windows certification, great. What about Linux? That would be good knowledge. Knowing about Mac OS these days would be really good. We're seeing more Mac OS than ever in the enterprise. And on top of that, we need to have understanding of networking, how does switching work? How do the switching technologies and protocols work? How can I do link aggregation? Uh, where would you set that up? Can I do link aggregation to a server? What technologies would I turn on to do that? What about uh, being able to prevent loops? Now, what about the routing side of things, the routing protocols and static routing, and be able to do uh, routing to different third parties? So now I'm NATing and sending information over the network. What about partners where we're doing IPsec tunnels? So already these, these things I just sort of rattled off there are technologies you should already know about because they have something to do with networking or operating systems. But notice I really didn't say anything on the security side yet. I really spit out a lot of buzzwords. But at that point, finally, once you have that knowledge, now we have to secure it. Now we have to look at permissions. Now we need to look at data going across the network. Now we need to capture information. And we need to set up our IPS. We need to make sure that our firewall rules are configured properly. We need to make sure that the policies we've set on our VPN don't prevent the wrong type of traffic being transferred. You know, those types of things are the layer on top that security really needs. And you will find, and this is what I would recommend you do, go find cloud security jobs being offered either in your particular geography or pick a geography like New York, Chicago, Miami, wherever you happen to live, and see what cloud security job they're asking for. Look, see what type of roles or, or knowledge they're asking for. So see if they want a particular certification. See if they want you to have knowledge in networking. See if there's a particular cloud they would prefer that you be familiar with. Maybe you should be getting an AWS uh, certification. Maybe you should be getting a Microsoft Azure certification. Um, but you don't know until you see what the employers would like you to have. And I think that's where we sometimes miss in our industry is we're so focused on get a cert, get a cert, get a cert that we sometimes forget to stop and think, why, why am I getting that cert again? What, what am I doing with this? There's got to be a means to that end. So what is the means? I'm working towards an AW cert because I looked at cloud security jobs in my area. And of the 10 jobs I found, seven of them asked for this particular AWS cert. There you go. That's a good reason for getting that certification. So you're setting yourself up for success. 
you're building a set of of tools and of knowledge that you can then bring forward in an interview and talk to somebody intelligently about. And unless you know what they're looking for, you'll never be able to have that conversation. Another long answer, but I think it sort of speaks to how we we look at technology, especially security, and we're able to work through it. Uh, let's see some other questions that folks have been asking about. Um, I'm going to keep going through some of the ones. Some of these are sort of duplicates to things I've already already asked about on here, but we can certainly talk about others as we step through that. Um, this one came up earlier this week because I was talking to somebody about the exams and how they are 90 minutes long and you could get a maximum of 90 questions. Well, I did the math and that's a minute of question. I know it's higher math. I was able to do it. I got a calculator. We worked it out. 90 questions over 90 minutes is one question every minute. And when you first see that, you think, oh, that is not a lot of time. And as you are sort of thinking this through, you may be intimidated alone at the amount of time you might have available. And it's an important thing to consider because once the 90 minutes is up, your screen goes blank and it says, we'll take whatever you've put in here. And hopefully you got enough right to give you enough points. But it's over at that point. You can't input anything else into the exam. They will evaluate whatever you've got so far. So one of the things I, I tell people all the time is that first, you're probably going to get fewer than 90. I don't know that anyone has ever, maybe one person has ever said, I got 90 questions. But they try to give you the questions so that you're able to get through them in that 90-minute time period. Some people have even said, oh, I got 80 questions. I got 82 questions. So you may have a little more than a minute for every question. I'll also say that a number of questions are two sentences answer. Like you'll know it right off. So you're able to get through that question in 30 seconds, and you can apply that time as you go through. So with the right time management, that can be very important. On your exam, there is a box at the top of the screen that says mark. And it's not referring to a person's name. It's saying you can mark that question or flag that question. Sometimes you'll see a flag or mark. You can flag that question. You just put a check mark on it, which sort of tags it. And you can go through your whole exam. And what I will tend to do is I'll read a question. I think I know what the answer is. But without spending a lot of time on that question, I just go with my gut. And then I flag it if I'm not 100%. And then I go to the next question. And if I know that one 100%, I answer it, and I go to the next question without flagging it. And then when I get through all the questions, you can bring up a summary screen that shows you all the questions that you answered, the answer you gave, A, B, C, D, or whatever it happened to be, and it will tell you if you flagged it or not. So you can then start going back through the ones you flagged to really read through it, make sure you didn't miss a word, make sure you really understood what the question was, see if you want to go with the gut question you put when you started or not, and you get to decide whether to unflag it and go to the next one. And you can keep doing this until your 90 minutes is up. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you is it may help you to read through the performance-based questions, skip over them without answering them, go through all of the multiple choice, and then go back to the performance-based questions at the beginning. Because on the CompTIA exams, you can jump to any question at any time on the exam. doesn't matter. You can just go. Now, it's a little different. If you've taken a Cisco exam before, you know once you push, uh, you answer a question and you push next, you can't go backwards. It's a linear-type scenario where you're just going straight through uh, in that particular scenario. So you can't backtrack on any of those. So that's not the case with CompTIA, thankfully. CompTIA allows you to jump anywhere at any time to any question. Those 90 questions come up. They're determined the instant you start the exam, and they don't change. Uh, Cisco is a little bit different. Uh, Cisco works through the questions in a very different way. So that's, what, that's my, my two time management uh, techniques for you. Skip over the performance-based questions with the goal that you're coming back before your timer goes out. And... Go through the questions, flag anything you don't know, and then keep it moving so that you don't lose time worrying about one particular question or having to mull through the answers or really think about it. You, you can lose a lot of time that way. Uh, time yourself. You know, my book with my practice exams is built with 90 questions. So it's the maximum you would ever get on an exam. And the questions are asked, and, and I even tell you, when you start them, start a timer. 
and go through all 90 questions. How'd you do? And you'll get some feel from that of, wow, I got halfway through, or I got all the way through and I was able to go through them twice. So you've got some things that can give you at least a heads up or a feel for how much time you might actually get on an actual exam. Uh, other questions. This is from Keith, who asks, what are your thoughts on parallels for a Mac slash Windows virtualization running Windows on a Mac? Uh, parallels, uh, I've used uh, I've used the um, on my machine. Well, I've got it on my machine, so we'll have a look right here. On my machine, I have used VirtualBox because it's free. It runs in Linux and Mac OS and Windows. And I run Parallels on my machine. By far, Parallels is the software that is most integrated into Mac OS. Um, it is one that really is a Mac OS app that works extremely well with the Mac OS operating system. And anytime you've ever seen Windows on my computer, it's in Parallels. So while we're doing this, I'm going to start Parallels. I'm going to start Windows 11 on my machine just so we can see it. Here's Windows 11 loading up. So this is on my desktop, the one that's right in front of me, uh, the one that you've looked at. Here we go. So it's the, it's the one that's sitting right uh, in front of my desk right there. So I've got Windows now running. This was Mac OS seconds ago, and it still is Mac OS. You can even see, if you look closely, there's the Mac OS window at the top. There's Mac OS behind it. So here is uh, Parallels, and it's just loading up. Uh, the Windows operating system. Whenever you see a Windows screenshot, you see me manipulating Windows in my videos, you see Windows working with anything else on my system, it's using Parallels. So uh, I never run or rarely, if ever, run Windows natively to demonstrate something unless it's something that's simply not available in a Windows environment. But otherwise, this is, I mean, it's Windows. You can do the normal Windows stuff on the system and work through everything. So it's it's uh, it's a perfect environment to use for virtualization. It works exceptionally well. It is integrated very nicely into the Windows op into the Mac OS operating system to the point where you can um, you can right click in your Finder on a particular data file, and you will even get the option to open that in a virtual machine that you haven't started yet. And so you choose that, it starts the VM, starts the application, loads the data file, and puts it on your screen, which is annoying. In my world, it's annoying. So I do, I've turned that off on my machine. But that's the level of integration they have to Mac OS. And if you're someone who's trying to get uh, Windows running on Mac OS, it is what I've found so far better than any of the others. Now, if you just want to run it temporarily, VirtualBox is free and it works great. But for me, I need a lot of additional functions. I need to run a lot of different operating systems. I have them all set up in my uh, Parallels, and that's what I would recommend using as well. I, I don't make anything from the folks at, at Parallels. They, that's just something I use um, and I like. So it works fine for me. But, but there's a lot of options out there. Make sure you try all of them. Almost all of them have a, a test. I think Parallels even has a, an evaluation feature. Those are great too. So make sure you do that. Um, other questions, uh, other things. Um, are there performance-based questions in the practice tests that are on my site? Or do we have to purchase these separately? No, there are performance-based questions in my practice tests. So there's three tests, 90 questions long. Five of those questions are performance-based questions for each exam. So five performance-based, 85 multiple choice questions in each practice exam, and you get three of them in each book. So that, that gives you a perspective anyway. Uh, that, that's, uh, and I've, I've had a number of people say, well, let's do more performance-based. I think that's great. We, of course, do performance-based questions in our study groups. So uh, the very first new question of every study group is a performance-based question. And you can go back for the last 12 months to see what options might be available there as well. I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, pretty useful to have that there. Uh, let's other questions. Let's keep going. Um, uh, this is one, and this is a question that seems to be popping up a lot in my chat lately. And I think there may be confusion around some of these. So since Radius and Kerberos both perform authentication, and I think we could put TACAX and LDAP in here as well, what is the difference between them? Well, there are, there are of course, 
differences in the underlying operation of all of these different authentication protocols. There's differences in things you can do with the authentication protocols and extensions and things you can add to them. But let's just talk about these from an authentication perspective because the vast majority of use cases for Radius, TACAX, Kerberos, and LDAP revolve around authentication. It is a huge part of any of these protocols. Well, are they are they interchangeable then for authentication? They could be, depending on how you're using them. I have a I have a slide in our authentication portion of the course where I talk about this. So when would you use Radius versus TACX? When would you use Radius versus Kerberos? When would you use LDAP versus Kerberos? There's there's a lot of nuance there. Some of it goes beyond the scope of A plus. But what it ultimately comes down to is what are you using today? So if you walk into a Windows environment, they have Active Directory because that's what Windows is really revolves around. You build Active Directory as that centralized management database for everybody in Windows on your network. It is probably the secret sauce that really made Windows the enterprise operating system by far. Nobody came close to what Active Directory was able to do. And everybody's still trying to play catch up with the Active Directory piece. And, and in some ways, you can duplicate that in other operating systems. And in other ways, they don't come close. Windows and the way that Active Directory was created was done so well that it really became the de facto standard for the enterprise. So if you're running Active Directory, then you already have a directory service that you could use for authentication because that's what all your Windows systems use for authentication. They use that Active Directory database. And they, under the surface, use Kerberos to do that. So it's encrypted. It's protected against replay attacks. It's protected against someone manipulating the time on these systems. There's a lot of great uh, cryptography built into Kerberos that adds additional security. And that's what you want when you're using these types of authentications in an enterprise. So you, you may need that level of security. And certainly Windows prefers that level of security. So you might have someone authenticating in from outside over uh, to a VPN concentrator. Well, let's just use our existing Microsoft Active Directory database to perform that authentication. Now, by default, natively, there is an LDAP extension that allows you to access Active Directory using the LDAP protocol. And that's why if you look at a lot of people that are authenticating through these third-party devices into your Active Directory database, they're almost always using LDAP. Well, but wait, what about all those great things that Kerberos gave, like the replay prevention and the uh, the tickets that they hand out to prevent somebody from manipulating the times and you've got digital signatures and all of that's great for Kerberos, but if you're trying to authenticate from an LDAP or from a, from a VPN concentrator that's literally sitting on the same shelf as your Active Directory database, you may not need all of that additional complexity and overhead, which ultimately will result in some additional support calls. So that's your balancing act. Do you go with complexity and, uh, and security, or do you go with something that's secure enough for your purposes that is built to be a little bit simpler than Kerberos? Well, maybe we'll go with LDAP. It's already integrated in Active Directory. We don't have to install anything extra on the Active Directory server. We just access it via LDAP and perform our authentications that way. All right, well, what if you don't want to use that as a database? Or maybe you prefer not doing LDAP. Maybe there are a lot of other services on your network that are using Radius that you've already built a Radius server, or maybe you've installed a Radius add-on into Active Directory because you can also active access your Active Directory database via Radius. Uh, maybe you're installing that on Active Directory, but that, in, that requires some additional installation. So there's some security and in, in some ways, some support concerns there. But maybe your company already has a separate Radius database. And I've, I've seen this before. So here's an example of where you might have both. Um, you're a big company. You're a multi-billion dollar Fortune 500 company with thousands of employees located around the world. When you get to that size of a company, the, the individual functions of IT become very siloed. So you have one group that handles 
Microsoft Windows desktops. You have another group that handles Linux desktops. You have another group that handles Mac OS desktops. You have a separate group that handles Active Directory. You have another group, and these are all different managers with different people. You have another group that handles security on these. So if you ever wanted to uh, install an authentication system, that would allow your technicians to gain access to switches, routers, VPNs, and other internal infrastructure devices, you may not be allowed to authenticate against the Active Directory database because the Active Directory team won't allow you to authenticate across their database. There are all these little, little fiefdoms that we have in these environments. Does that make sense? Of course not. Is that the way big businesses are? Yes, it is. Is that the way humans work? Yes, it is. Every This is my stuff. You can't, this is mine. You may not touch it. You may not use my database to authenticate for your dirty routers and switches. This is my pristine Active Directory. And to their point, they sort of do have a very good point that the entire business is based around these Active Directory servers. If anything happened to these Active Directory services, your multi-billion dollar corporation would not be able to do anything. And so they are naturally very protective of third parties using that data and opening them up for additional risk. So we're back to square one. We need something to authenticate against. Well, we can't use their database. We could make our own. What is the most widely available authentication database in the world? Radius. It is. Uh, there's Radius services for tons of different operating systems. There's Radius services for uh, different uh, clients, different uh, infrastructure devices, talk radius. So there's a great synergy there between switches, routers, and other devices, and a radius server that you may have installed yourself. So just roll up your own radius server. You, you install uh, uh, Linux. You install free radius. You put it in your data center. You write your own uh, connections to that. You build your own user database just for your technicians. And that way you can manipulate, change, modify, allow, or disallow access based on a database you have control of and not the Active Directory team. So that's a good example where you might use Radius instead of LDAP or Kerberos because you're just not allowed to use LDAP or Kerberos to your infrastructure, uh, Active Directory infrastructure. You may be building out your own database. Well, what if you're a huge Cisco shop? Well, if you're a huge Cisco shop, you probably have a TACX authentication uh, because Cisco natively and perhaps traditionally has used TACX to be able to perform this authentication. And I know there's a lot of nuance there with uh, TACX allows you these additional capabilities. TACX uses uh, TCP and Radius uses UDP, so TACX must be better, and that's not the case at all. So uh, UDP and TCP are not a determining factor. They're, neither is it has an advantage or disadvantage than the other. They are both completely useful and, and to be able to perform these functions, and neither has some type of uh, uh, use that's better than the other um, because, because it doesn't. It, it's just exactly, uh, it's really focused around what do I have in my my infrastructure now. Do I have a TACX server? Let's use TACX. Do I have a Radius server? Let's use Radius. Do I have an Active Directory database? Let's use LDAP or let's use a native Kerberos. So you've got different options depending on what's there, but it's almost always based around what you know, what you're comfortable with, what your company has centralized on. And there may be, if there isn't already, a security policy that says, if you are authenticating from a third-party device, you must use... LDAP. You must use Kerberos. You must use whatever it happens to be. So they may have that in the policies of your organization. If they don't, I would really recommend you look at the policies uh, to be able to do that because I think that's where people will get uh, uh, sort of uh, confused about what they should be doing because those policies will help you determine where you go with this. Well, we can't do TACAX because our policy says everything has to go to our internal radius server. Okay, done. Now we know exactly what the different options are. So I would recommend that as well. I think uh, you should find out what you're using inside, and then you're good um, And this. Uh, everybody, in fact, some people are even saying in the chat room, "Why well, we have Apple in our environment. It's, it's kind of a pain without directory services. Yeah, any large environment, heck, any medium-sized environment is 
almost unmanageable without directory services, but there's plenty of directory services available for Apple as well. So you could use uh, Microsoft's Active Directory database. You could authenticate to that from Microsoft uh, or from Mac OS. There's certainly capabilities to do that. So plenty of it there to, to be able to work through. Uh, other questions. Um, other questions. We're going to keep going with the list that we happen to have here. Um, D, this is a, a good question because it's something you could do right now today that might be useful. D asks, any open source software good for boosting up your resume for entry? Absolutely. I have a video. It's in the video description of this video on YouTube. That is a video on how to get a job in IT with no experience. And there are a lot of different aspects to this. I really focus on four different elements to be able to give you or, or give you an, a, a fighting chance to get a job in IT with no experience. And those categories or elements that I choose are you've got a formal education, you've got some industry certifications, you have some practical experience, and you know somebody who works there. Those four things. All four of those would be ideal. Sometimes you'll have three of those. Sometimes you have two of those. Sometimes you have one. If you have none, you're in trouble. The, the, the third one on that list is you have some practical experience. Now, that doesn't mean professional experience, which implies that somebody has paid you to be able to perform these functions, but you've done it before. And I think this is where open source really shines, is that you could build out the exact same enterprise configuration of services running in these large data centers, you could do that on your desktop with a VM software. Exactly the same config. Now, obviously, the amount of data you're seeing, the scope of what you're using, the uh, scalability of what you're using obviously varies quite a bit from what you would have in an enterprise. But what they don't tell you is that once you understand how it works, the scalability is relatively easy. The ability to make more of this and to, to have it in different places is easy once you understand how it operates. And so a good example is, well, we, I kind of just gave you this example. If you wanted to get a job working with Microsoft Windows or in a Windows environment, why don't you install Windows Server? Why don't you install Active Directory? Why don't you build up a separate Windows 10 or Windows 11 workstation and connect it to Active Directory that you're running on a separate VM. And now you can set group policy that affects the machine that you've just set up in this VM. That is a great task to go through, not only because you can tell somebody, oh, I run my own Active Directory infrastructure at home. Here's how I set it up. But more importantly, when you are building out this Active Directory infrastructure, there were, you're going to run into challenges. You might run into challenges finding the software to download. You might run into challenges during the installation process. You may run into challenges once you first try to connect the computer to the Active Directory database, and it's not seeing the Active Directory database, and you have to solve that problem. If you ever run into any problems when you're working on this home lab, make sure you document what happened. If you have the ability to do some screenshot or some movies on your phone, do it. If you have the ability to take screenshots or record the screen, do it so that you're able to really document what the message was that popped up. And then you can explain to somebody in an interview, you know, I installed Active Directory and here's the challenges I had during that process. But let me tell you how I found the problem, what I did to fix it and how I was able to resolve that going forward. That's really what we want during an interview. We want a story. We don't, we don't want to be the ones talking. We're giving you these questions and we're prompting you to hopefully you run with these. Tell me more about something you've done because there isn't a right or a wrong answer. There's only the answer. And I want that answer to be something that you've done where you've run into a challenge. You've had to resolve that challenge. And here's what the way you implemented the resolution. That is the normal day in the life of anybody in IT. Here's a problem. How do I fix this problem? Let me do the research for this problem. Let me find a fix. Let me implement the fix. That's your day-to-day. -day. That is probably one of the core job functions of anyone in IT, regardless of what they do. If you're on the help desk, if you're working with servers, if you're working with workstations, if you're working with networking, you're working with security, it doesn't matter. 
It's the same process all over and over again. And what we're looking for during an interview is somebody who knows what to do when something isn't working. I've worked with a lot of people in different types of companies where we are working together in a room. It's a conference room. We're working together on a problem. I pop up a screen. We're installing some software. And then, bang, message pops up. Here's an error. And it gives us a message on the screen. And I turn to the room and go, okay, what do we do? And, it, and it, you hear the crickets. There's just these doe-eyed, I don't know what. I don't know what. Um, hmm. have, have you rebooted it? Like they're, We're just trying stuff now. Let me throw stuff up here and see if that sticks. Why would I reboot? Does that error somehow indicate that a reboot is required at this point? Are we expecting it to work differently after a reboot and why? You know, there should be a reason. Now, could you reboot quickly and maybe get back to where you were? Probably not quickly, but you could. But it's not an educated response. So there has to be some type of process you go through to look at a problem, understand all of the things surrounding that problem, and create a set of steps that is either going to be the resolution to the issue, or it's not, but you need to make an educated decision about what that's going to be. And then you need to tell people about the process you went through. Well, I tried this. That didn't work. It seemed obvious that would work, but that didn't. And in a, a very old thread from the company in their forums, I found a reference to this, and that got me thinking about this other thing. And I thought, what if I change this? And that's what the problem happened to. That's what the resolution of the problem happened to be. You know, that's the story we want to hear in a in an interview. We want you to go through that, even if you talk for fifteen minutes. That's phenomenal. Just go through the whole story. You should have about three or four stories in your pocket. And anytime they ask you about, tell me about a time when you ran into an issue that you had a problem resolving. I hate these questions they give. The people interviewing you, by the way, they're not HR people. They're IT people. They're not interviewers. Uh, they're just hoping you give them information that can get you familiar so they can understand your personality and how much knowledge you happen to have on the topic. Occasionally, you will be in a room with people that are the, the other technologists on the team, and they're going to start throwing technical questions at you. And your answer should be, yep, I've done that, and here's the answer as I understand it. Or I've never even worked with that before. I've heard about that. I'd love to know more. If you give me more about that, I can go research it and give you more information. There should always be a yes and. It's almost, it all, is almost like you're in an improv troupe where they're asking you a question. Your answer should always be yes, and here's something else I did. So you can always redirect the questions. In many cases, we, we hope you will. Uh, but you should always, of course, when you're in a room with a bunch of technologists, they're going to ask you very specific questions. I've, I've mentioned before, one of the questions we would always ask of people when they came in was, um, and they're interviewing for a job as a next generation firewall systems engineer, which, by the way, pulls from operating systems, networking, security, IPsec, uh, other parts of the business, applications. It's a it's a role that requires you have a broad scope and a, a broad set of experience to be able to really do well. And so one of the questions that a systems engineer in the Northeast would always ask, an SE manager would always ask first is, tell me everything you know about ARP. That's it. It's like this tiny little question. Tell me everything you know about ARP. That's like six or seven words. That's it. And they just sit back. Now you got to talk about ARP. Okay, ARP's the address resolution protocol. This is how it would look on the network. This is what you would use it for. This is why it's an IPv4 and not IPv6, because in IPv6, we do this neighbor discovery. And what about proxy ARP? What about uh, uh, the other types of ARP? You'll run into three or four different ARP types, some that we use today, some that we don't really use much today. So uh, they, and then you can start getting into more details. Well, proxy ARP, here's where you might see that on this NATed link and be able to ARP on behalf of someone else. There's all of these technical things about ARP. And you could talk for an hour, if you know about ARP, about these details and specifics. And this SE manager would prompt them, well, what about proxy ARP? What about uh, uh, gratuitous ARP? What about just ARP in V4 versus ARP in V6? And so you got to go through all of these different conversations around one foundational protocol. So if someone was not familiar with 
technology on the network. They weren't, weren't familiar with the protocols. They weren't familiar with installing VPNs or NATing. Uh, they weren't familiar with failover of a primary and secondary and gratuitous ARP. Uh, then they wouldn't be able to have the conversation. And at that point, he was able to size people up very quickly on whether they were really familiar with these technologies or not by not asking directly what happens when a system fails over. Instead, he started with, tell me about ARP, kind of worked on the bottom, and then he was looking to see someone move their way towards the top. You know, it's a really good uh, barometer for what people might know. And he had a number of questions like that. All right, we've talked about ARP. Now tell me everything you know about IPsec. A little bit harder, but now you really have to go through the IPsec two days worth of a conversation if you know everything there is to know about IPsec. Tell me what you know about dynamic routing. Tell me what you know about route redistribution. Tell me what you need, what you know about uh, client-based VPNs. Tell me what you know about um, configuring some type of checks on a system when they first connect to a network. Tell me about uh, MDMs that you've used. You know, you get you can sort of flow through these different technologies. So you really do have to be able to be knowledgeable in those technologies, but hopefully have a story about them. Oh, well, let me tell you about the time when I set up my IPsec VPN on my home system. And I wanted to connect to the IPsec VPN from an IPsec client that I ran in Windows at a, a remote location. And here's the problems I ran into. And I ended up converting it over to an SSL VPN. And here's why. You know, those are, that's a great story. You can go on 20 minutes talking about that. But those are the types of things that can really differentiate you from anybody else. And it's all about having a home lab. It's all about having somebody in, the, in that, that uh, interview who will listen to the things you've done already. But you've got to have the stories in your pocket. You've got to be able to pull out those stories, if you will, virtually. And talk about those stories you happen to have there. So that's why I think uh, open source really provides some great capabilities there. If it's for security, install PFSense. There's, install any open source firewall. There's your, your firewall communication. Now add uh, Snort on top of it, open source intrusion prevention. So now you've got Snort reports. You've got uh, the uh, PFSense reports. You've got a front end. Maybe even brought reports with you. Wouldn't that be great if you show up at the interview and somebody starts asking you about, tell us what you've done with firewalls. This is a security role that you're interviewing for. Oh, I've got firewalls at home. I just installed the latest PF Sense. I plugged it into my network. You'll never believe what I saw on my network when I plugged this thing in. It was so surprising. You'll never believe what I saw. It's almost, you're, you're just, it's like a, a, bait, a clickbait on the internet. You'll never believe what happens next. And you get to tell them what happens next. In fact, I have a report here pull out your report. Here's what I saw on my network. Look at the amount of legitimate traffic. Look at the bots out on the internet trying to get in. And this is how many we blocked on the firewall in one 24-hour period. Those are, those are great conversations to have. And then you can say, and I broke out the bots into these categories, or PFSense may have a report for that already. Here are the different bots we saw out on the internet that would immediately be on my internal network if I did not have this firewall in place. That's, that's a great story. And it's interesting. Those are interesting stats. Um, in fact, they may not even have those stats in their existing firewalls. And they may say, well, I, we need to get this on ours. We need to see what we've blocked. I used to have a customer, um, and if you've ever installed firewalls before, the, the vast majority of firewalls have an inherent block at the bottom of the policy list. So they go through this list of access controls Usually it's if traffic is coming from this place and it's going to this place and it's using this application or this port number, allow it or block it. That's basically a firewall rule. And when you get to the bottom of the list, if nothing matched those tuples as you went through the firewall list, nothing matched those ACLs, the access control lists, at the very bottom, if you still didn't get a match, it just drops the traffic practically any firewall in the world, modern firewall in the world works this way. So if there's not a specific rule, we implicitly drop the traffic. But we don't log it. Because if, you're, if you don't have a rule that says it's important in any way, why would we log that information? So what a lot of people, well, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but a few of my customers, what they would do is at the very bottom of the list, they would put a rule that says, 
if traffic is coming from anywhere and going to anywhere, I want you to block it. So they've effectively taken what was implicit at the bottom of this list, and they've made it explicit. They are specifically writing a rule at the bottom that says, if it doesn't match anything above it, block it. But what's nice about having that rule in place is that the firewall, by default, will log it. And it changes your perspective of what's going on. You, of course, have to have plenty of storage space for the logs because your logs are going to increase dramatically, probably logarithmically. But after a day, they're able to now create reports that not only show what was allowed through the firewall and what was administratively specifically blocked in our rule base, but then it shows everything else that was blocked that we didn't even know was going on. And they were able to create reports from those. Those are amazing pieces of information. And unless you take that initiative to do that, you may never know what you're blocking. You're just maybe in many places, to be fair, really don't care. We blocked it. It's not coming in. I don't care. They don't, they don't have to justify that they blocked it. They've already got their budget dollars. They've already implemented the firewalls. We're just block it. I, I'm, I'm dealing with enough just with the logs that I have. Let's not worry about the other stuff. But if you're able to turn that on, it's remarkable the information you'll be able to create and the reports you'll have at that point. Most of the time when I found people doing that, it was a government-type facility because they, they were mandated to create those types of reports. Who's trying to get into this information, especially if it was federal, uh, the, the federal government, it's a uh, highly secure environment or relatively secure environment, and they're very sensitive to attackers, they may want to see how many people are, or how many bots are hitting us from the, the different countries and which countries are, they, are the bots at least starting from to be able to get to us. So that's really the interesting part of this is you get to build the story, find an interesting technology you like, whether it's Linux, Active Directory and Windows, uh, cloud-based technologies. A lot of cloud providers give you free access to the cloud uh, as long as you're only using a certain amount of resources. You have to be careful with that. Sometimes you go over those resources and they charge you. So you have to make sure that you're very careful about how many of those resources you're using. And you can, of course, set up limits there to prevent you from being charged more than you really want to be. Um, but try different cloud-based implementations. Try installing a firewall for yourself. So there's all these labs you can do, and practically all of it is available to do right now on your system without buying anything. Just download the software, it's open source, run it, and you've got a home lab. Done. That's it. That'd be, that'd be a really interesting set of tasks to do. And again, is it going to work out of the box? Probably not. Is it, are you going to run into problems? Oh, yeah. You're going to run into a lot of problems. Document the problems. You sometimes get so wrapped up in solving the issue, you kind of forget. And then once you solve it, you think back and go, okay, well, what was that problem we had yesterday? I need to write that down. Well, it's too late. It was yesterday. You, there's no way you're going to remember all everything that's there. So that's why I say record it, have a video. Whenever I'm shooting my courses, for example, I just keep the camera running. There's really no start and stop. It's just go. And all day the camera runs. And at the end of the day, I chop up what I've got. So there's never a time when I've missed anything. And that's what I want to get across to you is don't miss anything. Make sure you document all of these little important things. Things that you may not even think was important becomes incredibly important in an interview. So that's, that's what I would recommend. Lots of ways to do this. Yeah, maybe you write it down and write it down. Maybe you put it on a tablet. Maybe you take a picture. Maybe you get some video. Whatever you're using, do it just so you can reference that. Write down enough that you're able to make that happen. I document a lot of things in uh, a note book, in a notepad. Uh, in, in Mac OS, it's, uh, it's the notes app. I don't think I have the notes app. I don't want to show you my notes app because it's got sensitive info. But I, for example, all my server tech, all the things I do on my servers, because I'm my own server administrator, I document everything. Do I need to update the uh, HTT, the, the web certificate? What is the process for updating it? It's multiple steps. I document everything. I can get it so I can copy and paste so that I have that documentation. Does it take a long time to create the docs? It takes a long time. Absolutely, it does. Is it uh, incredibly valuable to have next month when I have to do this and I don't remember what I did last month? Oh, yeah, it's great. 
because the first time I did it, I copied and pasted what I did. I checked to make sure the copy and paste worked properly. Then next month, now I'm set. I just follow my instructions. What do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? How do I confirm it? How do I how do I do any of those things? So that's another important thing to do is just however you like to document, just stick it in there. I use my notes capability in Mac OS because the notes are automatically synchronized to every device I have, all my phones, all my tablets, uh, other laptops and other desktops that I have all suddenly have the same configuration. But there's also third party options for that too. I don't have to use the built-in notes. I could use OneNote. I could use Evernote. I could use a lot of different note-taking apps. So just uh, just figure out what different things might work for you. And I think that's a good way to approach really any scenario in technology. You should probably just get into the mode of doing this. So when you are working at your desk and they say, we have to upgrade this switch software, well, you could just wing it, download the software, install it, put it on the system, reboot the switch, and you're done. Maybe it's not too difficult. But what if you had to do that again, but you had to show someone else how to do it? What if your documents were already there? Or you needed to go back and say, what was the process I used last year to upgrade that software? Oh, here it is. I've got the list already. So you never know when that's going to come in handy. It's, uh, it's a good uh, process to go through. It's a good set of standard rules that you just do every time. So it's a natural part of what you're doing is you're documenting as you go. Uh, it will help you a lot when things don't go as you expect. And somebody asks, what did you do? What happened here? Well, I don't know. Let's go through the list. This is what I did step by step by copy by paste or whatever. So if it's already documented, now you can sort of rebuild it easily because you're going to screw up something eventually. It's the nature of the beast. It always happens. I've, I've got some whoppers that I've done in my, in my career. I've messed up stuff real good. Um, and still manage not to get fired. Um, I don't know how, but I didn't. But there's a good example of how do I document what I'm doing so that I could now repeat it later or show somebody what I did. Uh, just get used to doing that. It's pretty useful. Uh, so folks in the chat room are asking, well, do, do I have lab videos that kind of step through this? I don't because there's so many we could be doing. Uh, all I, I think I've mentioned four or five different labs just now. But fortunately, there are a lot of videos out there of people who've installed this software before who have run through this scenario, some of them with the idea that we'll build it out as a home lab. So those videos are out there on the YouTube. I don't have to redo those. They're already available to you. So I would recommend seeing what other documents you might have and, um, and videos might be available to step you through whatever the lab is that you would like to do. I think those are fun as well. Uh, I like to um, just try different apps sometimes. Well, there's an interesting Linux distribution I haven't seen before. Let's load it up. I'll open up a VM. I'll download the ISO. I'll tell the VM to boot from the ISO, and we'll, we'll install Linux from scratch. And what's it look like? Oh, it comes up in this, and here's what the screens do. Well, that's an interesting. And what's the default software that comes on this system? You know, running through that, that Linux distribution just so you have a little bit of familiarity. And what if you're interviewing next week for a position? And they said, well, tell us about some of the things you've done. You know, last week I loaded up this new Linux distribution, and you can talk all about it. And that was a 10-minute a process. It was 15 minutes to get that Linux distribution running. Uh, and you might say, well, I wanted to see how fast could I install a web server. Let's see, how fast can I do it? How long does it really take? And in this distribution, with this new thing, I did it this fast. Or you needed to... Uh, recover data from a USB drive that was deleted. Uh, well, let's load up a distribution that has software already on it that can do that for me. How well did it work? Let's test it. Let's take a drive. We'll put a document on it, and then I'll delete it in Windows. Now let's take the USB and plug it into a recovery system. Can I recover it? There, six labs. So those things, in fact, I, I that particular lab was, uh, was something I did myself. I... Uh, back in the day when we did not have phones with video on them, uh, I we would carry around video cameras, separate, handheld, battery-powered video cameras. Uh, and, and the later versions of these were solid-state cameras. They stored everything on internal memory inside of the system. They didn't have hard drives. They didn't have spinning drives. It was all solid-state. And uh, took my family on vacation. We, we went to Disney World. We had... 
uh, these amazing days of at Disney World, a video that we captured. Uh, we were selected for a, I, I got to be in a, um, a, a, a bird demonstration, you know, where everybody's in the stands and they put you at the bottom in a and, a, and an owl swoops through your arms. You've seen these types of things, right? So, and I, they have you put the camera up and the owl's coming right at the camera and it goes right above it. It was an amazing video and took it back to the room. We plugged it into the TV. It was amazing. We were able to watch it. We had such, such fun with that. And my son was, I don't know, two. He was very young at the time. Uh, went up to the camera and pushed a couple buttons and he raced everything on the SSD, on the solid state memory inside the, the camera days of vacation video gone instantly should the camera have not allowed it shouldn't have but he had just the right combination deleted everything so me being me i turn it off shut it down we don't touch it i go to the internet how is this data stored what what is this data on there is it recoverable what can we do they go oh yeah it's it's not only we're it's it's a it's a, a, a FAT32 drive inside of that. So it was something we could access. You can plug in a USB drive and put it into drive mode. And I used literally used Recova. For those of you in Windows, that's a, that's a very popular recovery software that was able to see that particular drive over USB. It found all of the video files. I was able to recover every single file on that camera and in less than an hour all of our vacation videos were back and visible and we were able to see them so there's your story for your interview let's do the same thing now today with the usb drive let's plug it in let's delete everything now recover it go what are you going to use why did you choose that particular software let's try different software let's do different drives plug in multiple drives, delete all of them. Does it, can we use Kali, a Kali distribution in Linux to recover it? Can we use Windows with Recover to recover it? Can we use third-party software to recover it? I did three of these and I can give my results, which one worked the best, which one was free, which one was commercial, and did any of them have any problems recovering the software? There's, there's a great 10-minute, 15-minute conversation in your interview. How can you, and it's about security. It's about recovering data. Why is it so important to do a wipe of the drive when you do a format rather than a quick format? I don't know. Let's do a quick format. Can you now go recover from the quick format? That, that's, a, that's all actually kind of fun. I might do that today. Let's do a quick format. How much data can I get? There you go. And what would you use? And then once you recovered, can you even go further? Were there things on the drive prior to the formatting that you can recover that aren't necessarily active anymore? Maybe they were deleted prior to the formatting. Can I recover data that was deleted prior to when the formatting happened? Well, that would require some different software, but it's on Kali. You get a Kali distribution, there's software there. Use, um, use uh, in fact, I was, I was playing around the other day with uh, Autopsy. That's the software that really goes in sector by sector and allows you to recover data. And if you talk to somebody in security about I used autopsy to be able to grab more data that was on this drive, I was able, in fact, what I did, here's, here's another one you can do because here's one that I did. Go to eBay, buy some drives that are used. That's it. Just make sure they're used and they're not wiped. Because they'll tell you in the eBay description, all of these drives have been wiped. You don't want those. Find a description where somebody's just selling a drive. They don't know why, about wiping. They don't know anything. They just sell the drive. And they said, oh, I formatted it. Well, let's see if they did. I'm buying that drive. Five bucks, they ship it to you. So for $5, you've now got this drive. Now, plug it into your Linux system, running autopsy, and see what you find. Now, I did this with a pack of like six or seven drives off of eBay, and I, I never published the video that I created for a number of reasons, uh, but I found that one of the drives was from a point-of-sale terminal from a home goods, not, not, not the store home goods, from a, a, a home, uh, a store that sold things for the home. 
It was not home goods. Uh, but I was able to see all of these transactions, coupons, a lot of things that were on that point of sale terminal just by going through recover, not recover, to uh, autopsy and pulling in all the data. It found bookmarks that were deleted. It found emails. It found more web traffic. Amazing what you can find there. There's your story. So now we're up to seven labs, right? So there's things you can do now for low cost or for a little, little bit of cost that might get you a job because you went through the process of, hmm, I wonder what that does. That's what you should always be doing. So uh, those, those are just a few of the examples, I think, that might help you. Um, and, and really figuring out, you'll be prepared also when somebody shows up with, uh, I just deleted everything on this. What can I do? Like, well, there are things we can do right now. Make sure it's powered off. We will uh, image that entire system so we're not affecting what's on there now. And now let's work with the image to recover the data that's there. I mean, if you've done it before, it now becomes relatively easy to do it again. Plus, you got a great story. Another story in your pocket. Well, I think that gives us a good place to stop, too. Hopefully, those stories are things you can work on over the next few days. Uh, if you liked what we did today, on Thursday, two days from now, we're doing our Core 2 A-plus study group, which would be a great thing for you to attend. We do more brand-new questions uh, at the beginning, and, of course, we open up the phone lines in the after show. we also got Network Plus and Security Plus study groups this month. Make sure you check on those at ProfessorMesser.com slash calendar. Thank you so much for being here, for your support, for your ongoing support of the website and our course notes and our practice exams and our vouchers. We cannot thank you enough. We appreciate your support. Uh, we'd love to see you. We're, of course, in our Discord when we're not here live. We'd love to see you there, too. Make sure you connect with the other folks there who are studying. It's a great community over at ProfessorMesser.com slash Discord. Thanks so much for, uh, for being here today. Stop back by in a couple of days. We'd love to see you Thursday, and we'll see you next time on the A-plus study group. Thanks, everybody.